how you present yourself to the world matters and changes how people perceive you in an incredibly profound way. This is something nearly every person learns when growing up and is far from an intellectual statement, but it's something that the majority of people don't consider in their day-to-day -day lives. Like our binocular vision, this small piece of knowledge feels second nature to most, to the point to where they don't even realize that they're doing it, and it's only when it's called out that people give the concept a bit more thought. Say, for instance, you have a job interview coming up at a prestigious company. This is the job that you've been wanting since you were a young kid, and you feel like all your years of schooling, all your efforts to build your skills, have been in service of getting this one particular job, and you want to make a good impression. The day of the interview, you realize that you don't have any laundry, and the only outfit that you have that is presently available is a pair of old gray sweatpants from high school, and a blouse that doesn't properly fit. Consider what would happen if you wore this outfit to the interview. What immediate things would the hiring manager think of you when they see you walk in, dressed partially in sweatpants and looking completely mismatched? Did they forget that they had an interview today? Is this how they choose to present themselves? If they're wearing this to the interview, what do they wear when meeting clients? Almost immediately, your name would be taken off of their list of potential hires, and even if you explained to them that you simply forgot to do your laundry and this was all you had left, the damage would already be done. Poor time management skills, the inability to keep a schedule and pre-plan accordingly. Now, think what would happen if everything had gone perfectly. What is the outfit that you'd wear to the interview? How would you do your makeup and your hair? Would you pick something professional, but not too overdone? Something that makes it seem like you aren't dressing up, like a prom tuxedo. This is just how you look. Dressing to make a good impression is easy, and you likely know exactly how to present yourself so that the majority of people would think highly of you. And when Ezra McCandless took the stand in her own defense, that's exactly what she did. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. This video is part four of our coverage of the case of Ezra McCandless. And if you have stumbled across this video before watching all the previous parts, I highly recommend that you go watch those other videos before you watch this one. Although I will be summarizing all the relevant case details in the first section of the video, watching the previous parts will allow you to see how the accused in this case was able to skillfully manipulate nearly everyone she came into contact with, and how she had, up until this point, gotten away with everything. This video would once again not be made possible had it not been for Rottweiler Investigations here on YouTube. Their channel is a treasure trove of true crime interrogation, trial, and deposition content, and we will be leaving a link to their channel in the description box down below, along with their PayPal and Cash App link. I'm going to be summarizing the details of this case as succinctly as possible. For those interested in all of the details, including coverage of all the previous police interviews she had done, those videos will be linked in the description box down below. This is Ezra McCandless. She is a 20-year-old, out-of-work hipster, who enjoyed photography and spending her days drinking free coffee at Racy's, a small coffee shop in the town of Eau Claire. She was extremely outgoing and would talk to anyone who came into the small shop stating that everyone who went there was her buddy, mainly because she relied on them to purchase her coffees for her. This is Jason Mangle. Jason is 13 years older than Ezra, a fact that he contends she kept from him when they first began talking. Jason met Ezra at Racy's, and according to both of them, they quickly fell in love. Within the first month of dating, Ezra had moved out of her mother's home and into Jason's apartment with his roommate. Jason worked as a medic in the National Guard, meaning that every few months, he would have to leave for a couple weeks to go on assignment. Their relationship quickly became toxic, with both parties alleging that the other one was controlling. Ezra stated, Jason was controlling because he wanted her to help out with bills and believed she was inappropriately affectionate with her male friends. Meanwhile, Jason felt the relationship was toxic because if he hung out with someone Ezra didn't like or thought they didn't like her, then she would accuse him of talking negatively about her and say that she was going to physically harm herself and it would be his fault. This is John Hansen. All you need to know about him is that he is a close friend of Jason and also frequented Racy's Coffee Shop. This is Alex Woodworth. Alex enjoyed philosophy, so much so that he spent all of his free time writing his own philosophical beliefs in his journal. He was the eldest of four children and was described by all who knew him as being deeply empathetic and kind to those around him. He had never been physically violent with any person, and his past partners would describe him as quiet and caring. He was close to both Jason and Ezra, and Jason had been made uncomfortable with how extremely close he and Ezra were. And that was mainly because Alex and Ezra were also secretly dating, although Ezra told Jason that he had nothing to worry about and that she wasn't interested in Alex in a romantic way. The duo would often go on dates, 
she would sleep over at his house, and a romantic relationship had progressed to the point of saying I love you to each other. Alex wanted Ezra to break up with Jason, especially since she would tell him that Jason was cruel and uncaring towards her. But Ezra stated that if she broke up with him, she would lose all of her friends, and so they continued to date each other in secret. She had also begun sleeping with John Hansen. In February of 2018, Jason had gone away on a drill for the National Guard, and he had asked Hansen to check in with Ezra to make sure she was okay. He worried about her when he was gone, because she would often state she couldn't be alone without him. And while he was away, John and Ezra also began to sleep together. This relationship was seemingly spurred on by Ezra, who stated she had a crush on John. After Jason returned home from training, she sent John the following text messages. Working out Agon, dose really make you want to fuck everything that's moved. Are you going to pound this anytime soon? Just let me know when I get my next in and out winky face. Also hanging out and doing art Agon would be nice because you're more than a good dick. Great. Also, while Jason was away, Ezra moved out of their shared apartment because his roommate was expecting her to contribute to the housing costs in a more meaningful way. She would move back in with her mother, and whenever they would get into a fight, Jason would pay for her to stay a couple of nights in a hotel. That way, she could unwind. One night, while staying in a hotel with Ezra, Jason went through her phone and found the messages between her and John. Obviously shocked that his best friend and girlfriend had been sleeping together, he confronted Ezra, who stated, that she hadn't slept with John at all. When she saw he had proof, she changed her story, stating that yes, they had slept together, but the sex had not been consensual. Not knowing what to believe, but believing his girlfriend wouldn't lie to him, Jason encouraged Ezra to speak to the police about the matter, where she formally accused John of sexual assault. An investigation was then launched, but Ezra seemed uncooperative. When asked if the police could have access to the messages that she had sent John, ones where they had talked about their sexual encounter, Ezra stated that she deleted them. When the officers asked John, he willingly provided the messages, and they showcased a very one-sided relationship in which Ezra was incredibly eager to sleep with John and had enjoyed the times they had been intimate. She also claimed that she had told multiple friends about the incident and that they would back up her statement, but they found the opposite was true. Ezra had spoken to her other friends at Racy's about spending time with John that week, and after they had slept together, she said he was amazing, fun, considerate, and that she couldn't wait to see him again. She also said she loved spending time with his son. She had also spoken to Alex, who told the detectives that Ezra had talked to him in detail about having sex with John, and said, though it was consensual, she regretted it. The sexual assault case was later closed, with no charges coming from it. After talking to the police, Jason was confused. He didn't know if Ezra was telling the truth, and he felt like the last eight months of his life had been a lie. Two of his closest friends had betrayed him, and they had lied to his face for weeks after sleeping with the person he thought he was going to marry. He didn't know who he could trust, so he asked Ezra for some distance. They didn't break up, but he didn't want anything to do with her for a short while. But Ezra was more engaged in their relationship than ever. She wrote him multiple times a day, telling him that she loved him deeply and would have never done anything to hurt him. She accused John and Alex of manipulating her and sexually exploiting her and stated that if she hadn't been so confused by them, she never would have cheated. She began to show up at places she knew he would be, casually running into him and bringing him her journals, declaring her unending ancient love to him. And although Jason tried to keep his boundaries, he once again began to sleep with her. On March 21st, the pair were talking, with Jason stating he didn't know if he could properly move forward with a relationship as he couldn't get the idea of her sleeping with his two close friends out of his head. She encouraged him to think of positive thoughts until those images were out of his head, and then informed him that she intended to see Alex the very next day. When Jason became confused and angry with the concept of her meeting up with the man she had spent months cheating on him with, the man who had apparently sexually exploited and manipulated her, she tried to placate him, saying she was only seeing him in order to tell him off for what he had done. But Jason didn't buy it. He had recently been made aware of how deep Ezra's relationship with Alex was, with one of their mutual friends telling him that Alex and Ezra had stated they loved each other and would spend all their time together. And now hearing that she wanted to spend time alone with him, he felt that he couldn't trust her. He told her that he didn't want to speak to her anymore and stopped replying to her texts. The next day, the former couple would run into each other, coincidentally, at Racy's. Ezra stated she was going to be finding her own apartment soon and moving back to the small town, but she seemed disheveled and strange. That morning marked the first time she had ever paid for her own coffee and left a tip as well. After leaving the coffee shop, she went to Alex's home to talk. 
Their conversation had been interrupted by Jason, who wanted to make sure his ex was safe. And he told the pair if they wanted to continue talking, they should do it somewhere public. Directly after, Ezra and Alex got into her car and drove off. Four hours later, Ezra was found on 88-year-old Don Sipple's farm, covered in mud and blood. The word boy had been cut into her arm. She claimed she'd been attacked, but didn't know by whom. She was also going by her birth name, Monica J. When she was brought to the hospital and evaluated by doctors, they found that she was mostly unharmed, with an exception of a few scratches and superficial cuts that seemed to be self-inflicted. Detectives talked to her about what had happened, but she maintained she had no idea. She was then informed that Alex and her car were still missing, and they told her that if she knew anything, they needed to know as soon as possible so they could potentially save Alex's life. But she said nothing. The following day, the police would find Ezra's car, with Alex's dead body hanging halfway out of it. He'd been stabbed 16 times in the neck, face, chest, and groin, and it appeared as if the scene had been staged. There were drag marks, indicating that whoever killed Alex had tried to pull him out of the backseat of the vehicle, but had given up halfway through. The scene also indicated that the majority of the attack happened outside of the car, with Alex trying to seek refuge inside the vehicle. Armed with this information, the detectives went to speak with Ezra again, and her story changed. She still maintained that she didn't know what happened to Alex, or what happened to her in general, but she said she remembered some things. Firstly, she told them that it had been Alex who carved the word boy into her arm. She claimed that he often ridiculed her for having identified as a male previously, and would use the term, as well as male pronouns, derogatorily towards her. Secondly, she also claimed that at some point during the drive, Alex had taken the wheel as she began to have a panic attack. And finally, she claimed that all she could really remember of the attack was feeling scared of Alex, like he had hurt her. The detectives then told Ezra that they had found Alex's body and that they knew she was lying about not remembering anything. And she stated they were right and then completely changed her story again. She claimed that Alex had driven her to the muddy road and gotten them stuck in the mud. While she attempted to get them out of the pickle they were in, he attempted to sexually assault her, and she killed him to save her life. The officers then told her that the details of her story still didn't align with the evidence, and that the way she claimed Alex had carved the word into her arm still didn't make any sense. Again, she admitted that she had lied about that too, and that after she had killed Alex, she then blacked out, then had woken up in the back of her car. Ezra then claimed that after realizing what had happened, she wanted to remember what happened so she carved the word boy into her arm so she wouldn't forget. She was then promptly arrested. In every video we make discussing a person taking the stand in their own defense, we emphasize how monumentally catastrophic that can be to a person's case. While many people view themselves as being generally likable, it's only when they are tasked with trying to make friends that they realize that not everyone is going to like them for one reason or another. For some, it can be something as small as the color of your hair or how you wear it. Though many people enjoy the look of unnatural hair colors, some people find them to be off-putting and a sign of poor moral character. For others, they might take issue with your tone of voice, finding it to be too high or grating, or thinking it is unreasonably low and put on. Regardless of their reasons, if a person doesn't like you, they are less likely to empathize with you. And if you are Ezra, who is trying to sell a frankly unbelievable story to a group of 12 men and women, you are going to want them to view you as sympathetically as possible. But in this case, the defense had no choice. The defense's argument was that Alex had attempted to sexually assault Ezra, and she acted in self-defense, but they had very little in the way of supporting evidence. She had lied multiple times after the attack, and the details she had told the police didn't line up with the crime scene or the evidence. They had spoken with all of Alex's ex-girlfriends, as well as his family and friends, and sifted through his journals, and they found no instances where he had been violent with anyone, or had displayed any worrying behavior. No one in his life stated that he had ever been aggressive with them, or even possessive of them in a romantic setting, and there was truly no one who would corroborate Ezra's story. With that in mind, the defense was forced to put Ezra on the stand, and hope that she could convince the men and women of the jury that she should be believed more than the direct crime scene evidence. Prior to Ezra's arrest, she had presented herself in an incredibly meticulous way. She had a consistent color palette that she would stick to mostly filled with mustard yellows, hunter greens, and rich red tones. She kept her hair short, cropped, and purposely androgynous, due to her fluid sexuality, and stated she enjoyed shifting her appearance, and looking more masculine some days and more feminine others, but always straddling the line between the two. However, when she would appear in court, 
her appearance was drastically altered. Her hair had lightened to a softer shade of brown, and she had kept it long and natural, allowing for her curls to frame her face. Her makeup was more subdued, with emphasis being placed on making her eyes appear bigger. The light shimmer placed on the globe of her lid and the white eyeliner on her bottom eyelash line was done to make her eyes look wide and unsure and stood in stark contrast to how she had done her makeup outside of court. Focus was placed on her wearing neutral tones, mostly pinks and whites, which served to brighten her face and fit her natural coloring. She had done a complete transformation in under a year, going from a hipster who wanted to push gender norms to attempting to look as feminine and delicate as possible. This was obviously a tactic used by the defense to try and make Ezra more palatable to the jury. The details of the attack were brutal. She had stabbed Alex in the head, neck, and groin 16 times, and the defense's goal was to make it appear as if that were impossible for her to accomplish, unless she was in extreme duress. Let's see if they were able to do that. You state your name and spell it for the record, please. My name is Ezra McCandless. Um... E-M-E-Z-R-A-M-C-C-A-N-D-L-E-S-S. Okay, Ezra, I'm going to ask you to speak really clearly into the microphone because you're soft-spoken. Yes. Okay. So everybody can hear you. All right? All right. Um, I guess the first question I'm going to ask you is, why Ezra McCandless? Why that name? Why Ezra McCandless? Well, I have gone through a lot of changes in my life regarding identity and what really fits me. And I tried on a few names, but I found ultimately that Ezra fit perfectly for who I am. This, in my opinion, is just about the worst way to start this direct examination. I fully appreciate why it was done, and I am not a defense attorney, but having Ezra wistfully recount how she settled on her name as if she is doing a one-woman show comes across as incredibly out of place when she is on trial for first-degree murder. It makes her seem painfully unaware of the situation that she's in, as if she doesn't take the fact that she killed someone seriously. I understand the logic behind the decision, as any legal team working on this case would be trying to make Ezra look as harmless as possible. She needs to seem fragile, like she couldn't hurt a fly. So when they discuss how she brutally stabbed Alex 16 times in the head, throat, torso, and groin, they are already primed to think that she must have been in extreme peril to do something like that. It would have been much more effective for her legal team to coach her into looking distraught and unwell if she appeared like she had tried to put herself together but was overwhelmed by the sheer weight of the situation. The majority of people would begin to feel bad for her, but her appearance is so perfectly polished and manicured and so outside of the norm for how she usually presented herself that it comes across as false and strange. What was your birth name? My birth name was Monica J. And um, did your name eventually become the last name Carlin? Yes. Okay. So why did you decide specifically, I'm going to ask you the specifics of both names and what they mean to you. Let's talk about the last name first, why All you right. changed your last name. I changed my last name, not to change my last name because of family's sake, but to... I changed it because of the name McCandless is from an individual named Christopher McCandless from Into the Wild, he's known for. And his love for nature, his philosophies for life, they were very in tune and aligned with who I am. So I honored him by taking his last name. And what about... Um, and Into the Wild, just everybody might not know what it is, just in a sentence, tell us. It's a novel. It's a book he wrote. Christopher McCandless did not write Into the Wild. While I would usually try not to harp on this fact, it's notable that the majority of what she has said and will say about Christopher and Into the Wild, for which she got her namesake from, is false. This was a novel that was important enough to her that she took up his name in a way to honor him, but she doesn't actually know the basic details from the book. Okay. Uh, it was a book written ab about him? Yes, about him. Okay. And what about the name Ezra? How did you choose that name? I was on a family vacation, and it was just absolutely wonderful. And I spotted the name Ezra, and I noticed how it's it's more neutral. It's It leans not necessarily masculine, and it's not necessarily completely feminine. And I found that just, it felt right to me. 
at a certain point in your life, did you feel that being identified as female did not fit you? Yes. Okay. Why don't you explain how you view your gender? In high school, I found that I felt more comfortable being masculine. It was, it was how I identified at the time. Was my alignment was very masculine. What about now? Now I'm I'm fluid, so I I lean now more towards my femininity as a woman. Okay. And has this fluidity been going on for a period of time? Yes, for a few years now. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you what might seem like a silly question, but um, just some people knows. Have you been doodling in court? Yes. Can you I explain have. why? Imagine you were the family of Alex Woodworth. You attend the trial for his murder, wanting to see justice done in his case. You take the stand and talk about the type of person your relative was, because the person who viciously ended his life is claiming that he was a violent, controlling person. You are face to face with the woman who admitted to murdering him, a fact that she doesn't deny, but argues was justified. And there she is doodling. Instead of appreciating the words that you're saying, or listening to other people give their testimony as to the kind of person that Alex was, or the evidence in this case, and how it all points to her murdering him in cold blood, Ezra was doodling the entire time. Again, I would have to imagine that her legal team asked her not to do this, telling her that if she looked remorseful while listening to the testimony being given during the trial, that it could help make her look more sympathetic, and as if she took the trial and Alex's death seriously. But she couldn't. She simply had to draw. Her continued doodling through horrific testimony, while also portraying herself in this almost jovial manner on the stand, is making her appear cold and callous. If you saw a person behaving like this, you would think that something was really wrong with them, or that they're doing a TED talk about finding oneself, or giving a presentation in their favorite class. You wouldn't think that this person is on trial for first degree homicide. If you want to see any of her art, here are some examples from her still active Instagram. While in prison, she has a friend running the account, and she sells paintings like these. Continuing on. Well, I've been doodling in court because there's, there's times when this experience is very traumatic, and it helps center me so that I can breathe through it and I can focus on something at the time so that I can breathe. Though there were times where Ezra cried during court, like when some of her friends testified against her and when her family was called up to the stand, it's not insignificant that she did not show any signs of mental distress during the trial. While PTSD and trauma responses are different from person to person, Ezra was found to be smiling and drawing throughout the entire trial in a way that doesn't align with what she is saying here. Are you an artist? Yes. Can you just tell the jury a little bit about how you developed your interest in art? I developed my interest in art when I was as young as five years old. I've always had an interest in art and I've been doing it since then. And I continued to have a passion for it throughout high school and even in secondary school when I decided to take art and work for a professor of the arts and hang for a gallery. Ezra has this habit of shaking her head when she speaks in a manner that comes across as incredibly forced. When she is talking about herself, she will shake her head from side to side, as if to be blissfully recounting the most important moment of her life and being lost in a daydream. It's something that is mostly seen in stage shows and other forms of media, and because of that, it comes across as her attempt to appear sincere, rather than simply being sincere. All right. Um, and the other thing I want to ask you is um, what you, your height and weight are. So what's your height, first of all? I'm 5'2". And how much do you weigh? I roughly... Or, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I roughly weigh 100 and, between 115 and 120 pounds. Back in March yes. of 2018, <laughs> approximately what was your weight or... Approximately, my weight was 115. Wait, so about the same? Yes. Okay. Um, were there times before then where you were heavier? Yes. Okay. I'm going to ask you about meeting Alex. All right. Yes. Um, why don't this is the first time that Alex's name has been said while Ezra is on the stand. 
and she looks down, says yes, then looks back up, and purses her lips to stop smiling. We're not even ten minutes into the direct examination, yet she has pursed her lips in this way the entire time. Again, this behavior isn't in step with the person that Ezra and her defense team has tried to paint her out to be. Their entire argument is that Ezra deeply loved Alex, but was also scared of him and took his life in an act of self-defense. She literally just stated that hearing the details surrounding this case is deeply traumatizing for her, so she has to doodle to center herself, and yet, when she first hears the name of the man who she killed, she's holding back a smile. I'll stop pausing so frequently soon, but her behavior is baffling. Why don't you tell us how you met Alex Woodworth? I met Alex Woodworth one night when I noticed him. He was riding alone inside a bar called The Joint. He, he just seemed very focused, and I thought it was interesting that he was alone amongst all these people so focused on his writing. And when you saw him alone, focused on your, his writing, did you have any conversation with him? Yes. How did that occur? I was curious as to how he could focus alone, uh, alone on this topic. I approached him and I said, what are you writing about? Just tell me about it. Uh, I'm going to show you what has been marked as exhibit number 696. Six, 97. 97, sorry, can't see anything without my glasses, and ask you to identify what this is. This is a table of contents of Alex's writings. Okay, you've seen this before? Yes. All right, and just to understand what writings they are, you were in court when the original copies of his journal were shown. Yes. Right? And is this an accurate copy of them? Yes. All right. And just showing you, can you name the names of the journals? Yes. Do you want me to read? Yes, you can. You can. And it's just so the jury is clear. Does this book contain both the original copies of the original handwriting and the typed copies to make it easier to read? Yes. All right. Okay. So what are the names of the journals? Personal notes, research ideas, and the quest to understand. Okay, that's the first journal? Yes. The second? Extra Scraver. Okay, and the third? I met a man walking through a briar patch. He was looking for the rose promised by the thorns. Okay. Judge, I would move Exhibit 697 into evidence. Driver, can we just approach a second? Yes. All right, well, Exhibit 697, subject to uh, a limitation, um, will be received. When you met Mr. Woodworth, yes, I'm going to show you page six. From the exhibit you just saw. Yes. Did, first of all, on that day, did Alex Woodworth show you his journal? Yes. And Looking at page six, I'm just going to ask you to take a minute to look. There's two pages to page six, a typed version and a handwritten version. Yes. Are those the same, the typed version and the handwritten version? Yes, they are. Did he share with you what he had written on that day? Yes, he did share with me. Did you also read it at a later date? Yes. All right. I'm going to put this on the... Oh, no. And just to clarify the record, this is a journal entry from August 8th, 2017, right? Okay. So just to show what the handwritten version looks like, is this the handwritten version? Yes. All right. Now so we can read it, I'm going to show you the typed version. Huh? Okay. 
So in this typed version, after it starts with a quotation, right? Yes. And that's yes. from a book. Yes. Do you know who the author of that book is? No, I cannot remember. Okay, that's fine. Can you read the next sentence to the jury? I am oddly preoccupied with the concept of cannibalism, not quite with the actual cannibalism practice, but rather the indwelling metaphors our understanding actually works with. All right. The essay, what does the essay go on to talk about without having to read every line? Cannibalism is mentioned in this essay a few times. It goes on to deal with the concept of metaphorical cannibalism and the concept of cannibalism itself as what cannibalism renders you as and the anxieties and the fears and being a meal in a sense. Is it fair to say, or is your interpretation of the essay that it is philosophical in nature? Yes. As opposed to literal in nature? Yes. Despite the entry stating that Alex was discussing cannibalism as a philosophical concept, and Ezra agreeing that he was discussing cannibalism as a metaphor, they would go on to argue that Alex was genuinely interested in cannibalism, and that he was dangerous because of this, and that Ezra was deeply scared that he would eventually eat her. Alex quite literally wrote, I am preoccupied with the concept of cannibalism, not quite the actual cannibalism as practiced, but the rather indwelling metaphors our understanding actually works with. He couldn't have been more clear, but her legal team is trying to state that Alex wasn't being honest in his own journals. It's similar to if someone tried to argue that because you're watching this video right now and are interested in true crime, that you are inherently dangerous and were plotting to kill them. I'll come back to his writings on cannibalism, but I'm going to uh, ask you a little more about that conversation with him. Yes. Aside from looking at his journal about cannibalism, what discussions did you and Alex Woodworth have at that time? Well, I was, he caught me right away because I thought it was quite a peculiar subject, cannibalism. And I was interested in what he meant, what I understood. He was speaking of it philosophically, and I also wanted his ideas and his concepts of literally cannibalism. So we talked back and forth about a few artists that have partaken in cannibalism that he mentioned. We spoke about his the anxieties of and what it means for someone to consume another. What did he say that at that time, on August 8th, or roughly August 8th of 2017, what did he tell you about what he meant by consuming another? Objection at hearsay, Your Honor. Uh, overrule. Thank you. Uh, again, we have had a pretrial ruling on this, and it doesn't go to the truth of the matter. It only goes to what Ms. McCandless heard or understood or what was in her mind. So you may proceed. As long as we're on that understanding, then that's fine. Okay. I withdraw the objection. Can you ask the question again, please? Sure. Uh, actually, I'll have the court reporter read it back, so it's exactly the same. Okay. Okay, so what did he say at that time on August 8th, or roughly August 8th of 2017, what did he tell you about? What did he tell you about what he meant by consuming others? Thank you. At that time, when we were deep in this discussion, he was. We talked about. He mostly talked about the philosophical sense, and he also mentioned the fact that often individuals partook in cannibalism because it was in essence, a consumption of one's power, to take in another's flesh. All right. Besides cannibalism, did you talk about other things with him that evening? Yes. All right. At some point, was your conversation interrupted by another person? It was. Who came over to interrupt your conversation? 
My boyfriend at the time, Jason, pulled me aside and he kind of interrupted our conversation. Her change of tone here indicates that she was, and still is, annoyed at the interruption, which is laughable, as Jason had every reason to feel uncomfortable with Ezra talking to Alex, although he had no way of knowing that they would end up sleeping together and betraying his trust in a deep, intimate way. He had been watching his girlfriend fall into a deep, and from his perspective, inappropriate conversation with another person. But instead of being understanding, or at the very least, having the wherewithal to view this interaction through a different lens, in hindsight, she still feels that this was Jason being controlling and getting in the way of a harmless interaction. The fact that she is still somewhat annoyed that her boyfriend felt that she was behaving inappropriately with a man she would spend months cheating on him with is absurd. Um... What impressions or feelings did you have after Jason interrupted your conversation? Can you, about him interrupting? Yes, about him interrupting. Well, I was, I felt that that my conversation was cut short, that I had plenty more to talk about. Did you, were you able to then continue your conversation with Alex Woodworth? Yes. Um, Why don't you just summarize that for us? What else you talked about? Well, we went out for a smoke and we started talking about our love for spiders because we both noticed a spider in the window sill or the a spider web. We noticed it at the same time. Okay. Um, so that first time that you talked to Alex, um, how long... About, if you can remember approximately, how long do you think your conversation was with him on that particular date? In whole, I think our conversation was about an hour. Did um, you uh, continue your friendship after that? Yes. And um, did you eventually become more than just friends? Yes. All right. We're going to return to that. But right now, I'm going to get into a different topic with you, all right? I'm going to ask you about Jason Mangle. All right. Um, tell us briefly how you met Jason. I met Jason outside of a coffee shop one night after a music festival. What's the name of that coffee shop? Racy Delanes. All right. Um, and just tell us a little bit about meeting him. He let out a big sigh, and I was curious why he was doing that. He seemed quite frustrated, so I said, well, what's the matter? And... We just, we instantly started talking, and we talked almost all night. After that all-night conversation, what happened with you and Jason? Well, after we exchanged information, we had begun texting and back and forth, and we started seeing each other after. At that time, where were you living? I was living with my mother in Stanley, Wisconsin. The texting went on, and did it texting lead to dating? Yes. You sound kind of happy about that, or (laughs) not happy, intense, I would say, would be the word. We fell in love quite fast because we had just so much in common. This was somewhat of a pattern for Ezra, as she seemed to have so much in common with nearly everyone she met. It seemed that she would adopt the characteristics of those she was around, and in a way, reflect them back to themselves for a time being. And how, in the beginning of that relationship, how would you characterize how Jason treated you? He treated me very well. What was the age difference, or what is the age difference between you and Jason Mangle? It's about 13, 14 years apart. Do you know how old you were when you met him? Yes, I was about 19. Did you know how old he was? Yes. How old was he then? If you recall. He was about 34. All right. So that's how you remember it? Yeah. All right. So there's about a 15 or so year age difference between the two of you? Yes. Did you realize that right away when you met him? Yes. How did you feel about that? That age difference specifically? The age difference? Well, I wasn't concerned necessarily that we had an age gap I felt a bit awkward that he was so much older than me and he was even close to my own parents' age. Did there come a time in your relationship where you got pregnant? Yes. How did you discover that? 
I was very sick and I had been throwing up for weeks and I decided to go buy a pregnancy test and take it. Uh, when you say buy a pregnancy test, do you mean those kinds they sell in the drugstore that give you a line? Yes. All right. So where were you when you took the pregnancy test? Do you remember? I was at a gas station. And did you tell Jason about it? Yes, I did. How did he react? He, he seemed anxious and he wanted to go to get it. He wanted to go get the test confirmed at the doctor's and he was, it was hard to really read what he was thinking at the time. Did you go to the doctor? Yes, I did. After, um, uh, and what was the result from the doctor's office? I was in fact pregnant. Ultimately, uh, what did you decide to do about that pregnancy? I ultimately decided to terminate the pregnancy early on. Why? I was, I wasn't sure what to do at that time. I was scared, I was so young, I was confused as to really what to do. So I decided, it, was, it felt rushed, I decided to terminate the pregnancy. And um, would it be fair to say that even then you had very conflicted feelings? Yes. Objection leading. Sustained. All right. Um, how did terminating the pregnancy make you feel? I felt very empty after. I felt very, it hurt emotionally and physically and it made me feel alone and very empty. After terminating the pregnancy, um, did you tell Jason you did not want him in the room? I did, yes. Why? I felt overwhelmingly ashamed and I just felt like I didn't want to have him witness me in, like that. I didn't, I didn't want him to. This abortion and its aftermath, you, was there a change at all to your relationship? Yes. Why don't you tell us about that? After the abortion, things between me and my partner, Jason, it caused a lot of distance between us. He began sleeping on the couch and he rejected physical intimacy, even holding my hand at times. Just so we set the date, do you recall the date that you terminated your pregnancy? Yes. When was it? The only date that I could schedule was October 6th. Is that a significant day to you in another way? Yes. Why? It's my birthday. So you said he started sleeping on the couch. <coughs> yes. Um, lacked physical intimacy, wouldn't even hold your hand. Were there other things going on in your relationship that made you feel uneasy or unhappy? Yes. Why don't you tell us about those? Jason and I started feeling frustrated and I felt very micromanaged at the time. He, he, want, he was controlling me in many ways and micromanaging me and we, we had just, we had started to grow apart as a couple. According to texts between the two via Instagram and Facebook, Jason micromanaging involved him asking her to chip in with some of the bills and telling her he didn't like the way she talked to other men in a flirtatious way. She characterized this to her friends as being incredibly controlling and cruel towards her. She did a similar thing when talking about her parents, claiming that they were oppressive towards her when she was living with them, because they were constantly asking her when she was going to get a job and move out on her own. In previous videos, we discussed how Ezra had a tendency to imply wrongdoing on another person's part, before directly accusing them of anything. If she was talking to a friend about her relationship with Jason, she wouldn't simply say that he was controlling. She would start by saying she was deeply hurt and upset by something Jason did, but she didn't want to talk about it too much because she knows he didn't mean anything by it. After a bit of prodding from every friend she was talking to, 
she would talk about how he made her feel, without giving explicit details as to what even happened. This slow leak of information would make the other party deeply empathize with Ezra and see her as a sweet, forgiving person who just wanted to see the best in people, despite the fact that there were multiple instances where she would do this where she was essentially gossiping about a person. She did this about her family, her friends, her boyfriends, people she barely even knew. It was constant, and, as you will witness in this hours-long, direct examination, Ezra would basically accuse everyone in her life of being abusive towards her in some way. Were there anything that he did that made you feel physically uncomfortable? Yes, he... he never hit me, but he would be very erratic with his gestures, and sometimes he would throw things or break things, and it just... that made me uneasy. Um, did he make accusations of you at all? Yes. Why don't you give us an example? An example of an accusation is that I was clumsy and that I would lose his things all of the time. And there was a time where he got very heated over a Sharpie marker, even. And it caused an argument between us. What did he say about the Sharpie marker? that I misplaced it on purpose, and I just, I'm so stupid for losing things all the time, I shouldn't touch his things, that that's about what it was about. You were in court when Jenna Van de Zant testified? Yes. And um, she identified herself as, well, first of all, did Jason have a roommate back at that time? Yes, he did. What was that roommate's name? His name was Alexander, Z Alexander Zink. And what was Jenna Van de Zandt's relationship to Alexander Zink? They were boyfriend and girlfriend. Uh, was she somebody that at that time you became close to? Yes. You heard her testify about Jason um, criticizing your makeup, or uh, what was that about? Well, he would at times criticize my makeup. He would say I looked like a clown, or he would criticize my weight, even though at that time I was very small from being sick. And he just anything he could really pick at, he would. In Jenna Van de Zandt's testimony, she described Jason as being an incredibly thoughtless individual, particularly when it came to his words. He had a tendency to say what he felt without any sort of filter, and would often argue that he wasn't being mean, he was just being honest. On multiple occasions, Jason had said unkind and rude things to Jenna, and she had witnessed one occasion where Jason told Ezra that the makeup she had done that day made her look like a clown. That was particularly unkind because Ezra was dealing with a bad bout of acne. What Jenna did not testify to was Jason being abusive, emotionally manipulative, or breaking things in or around the apartment which is important as she lived there with both Ezra and Jason. Um, you mentioned that Jason and your adoptive father, Joe Shane Carlin, are about the same age. Yes. And um, did Jason have a relationship? Um, well, first, did Jason in some ways remind you of your father? Oh, yes. He definitely reminded me of my father. Okay. Can... It, it, currently, how's your relationship with your father? I love him, and we're fine. Okay. But growing up, how was your relationship with your father? It was very turbulent. I was often afraid of him and intimidated and very put down. Um, well, first of all, let me ask about both your parents, your mother and your father. When you grew up, yes. at a certain point, did your mother... And Joe Shane get a divorce? Yes. How old were you then? I was in middle school, so 11, 12. Before the divorce, what word would you say most described that household? It was like living with two, two tornadoes in one room. All right. And focusing on that, um, yes. the tornado that was Joe Shane, when you say tornadoes, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that, that is... They're both very strong, opinionated people, and they just would often butt heads. And my mom had, she disagreed about ways he would discipline me, and that would cause arguments. Was there a lot of time when your mom was not at home during that period of your life? Yes, she was working. And 
when you were with Joe Shane and your mother wasn't around. Yes. Tell us about some of the things he would do. Some of the things he would do when I was younger is he often, he was, he was very loud. He would always yell about something or he would put me down. He often called me stupid and he just, he would say I wouldn't amount to much and that I was slow and he just, he was very emotionally abusive to me. Um, how did you respond to that? I responded by just being quiet and I would cry and I would just often go off and be alone. When you would cry, how would he handle that? He doesn't approve of crying. He would tell me that he would give me something to cry about. Was part of your response of dealing with him, um, did you sometimes feel like you were like spaced out or lost a sense of where you were? Yes. Why don't you tell us about that? There was often times to tone out the yelling and the name calling that I felt very distant from myself. I would essentially just close off everything around me and I didn't want to cry in front of him. So I would, in that, I would prevent myself from crying. Um, were there times where you found yourself in that state without even realizing you were going there? Yes, there was times I would zone out and I wouldn't even realize I was doing it at the time. Ezra's defense team was not given an easy task. They had to somehow validate the fact that she stabbed her ex-boyfriend 16 times, that she carved the word boy into her arm, then claimed that he had done it, and then pretended to forget the details of the attack until the police found the body, not to mention the fact that the physical evidence at the scene didn't align with what she claimed had happened. And here we get the first sign of how they are going to try and justify her lies and behavior after she was taken to the hospital. If you remember, Ezra told Detective Proc the day after she appeared on Don Sipple's farm that she had never lost time like this before. She had gone through plenty of traumatic situations, but her mind had never blacked out the way it had here. Yet, now she is saying she would have these moments of blacking out throughout her life, starting in her childhood. As is the question with nearly everything she says, why would she lie about that specifically? If this is the truth, as she wants us to believe it, then why would she lie? She wants us to believe she only lies about things that would make her story more believable. Like when she lied about not remembering what happened, which she said she only did because she, quote, could not stop thinking about it and was scared. But when the only thing she consistently does is lie, how can we believe she is telling the truth now? All right. Um, and getting back to Jason. Yes. Um, did he meet your parents? Yes. And... Jason and your father, what kind of relationship did they have? Very buddy-buddy. They are very close with each other. Okay. So coming back to the issue, leaving aside your family. Yes. Coming back to the issue of you and Jason, and you're in this period where things aren't going well. Yes. What is happening at this point in your friendship with Alex Woodworth? And, and I'm directing you specifically to October Yes. Of 2017, okay? After the abortion. Alex okay. and I, we began, he would notice me at the coffee shop and I would notice him more and we started going on long walks with each other after he would close. When you say he would close, what do you mean? He, closing up the restaurant, coffee shop, Racy Delane's. Do you mean he was closing up because he was the last patron there, or was he working there? Working. And on these walks, um, why don't you tell us what you and Alex talked about? Alex and I, we talked about life itself. I would talk about nature and how I viewed things. And then Alex would talk about how he would view things and his philosophies and his ramblings as he would say and often I was kind of the yin to his yang because a lot of his philosophies countered mine because mine are very in the sunlight in the sunshine and his are very much so a rainy day well she's certainly proud of that statement like in her coverage of Nancy Brophy it's notable that she talks about Alex in reference to herself she recalls his philosophies on life 
as being in contrast to hers in a way that is incredibly complementary to herself. Um, did you tell Alex about your abortion? Yes, I did. I, on one of our walks, I shared with him what I was going through at that time. And he allowed me to open up about it and how I really truly felt and all of the pain that came with it. As you got close to Alex. Yes. Did you learn more about his past? I, I learned some things about his past, yes. And your relationship, I'm going to ask you some questions about his past, actually. All right. What did you learn about Alex and his feelings as you became close with him? Feelings towards his past? Yeah, just tell us some of the things he shared with you. Some of the things he shared with me is that he often puts a happy face on when he goes back home for holidays, and at times it can deeply depress him and he often felt like an outsider that he had arguments with his father I believe and that he was deeply I religious guess I'm gonna object your honor I don't see I don't see the relevance number one and number two uh, it's hearsay do I understand why she asked this question yes I do the defense wants to paint Alex as a deeply troubled dark character who was dangerous and physically assaulted Ezra, but, much like the defense asking her to explain how she chose her name, the way she answers this question only serves to make her look callous. Alex's family was in the courtroom. His mother and grandmother had testified ahead of this, and his family was profoundly affected by his murder. For his murderer to take the stand and discuss how he felt misunderstood, and in fact unseen by his family, would have caused them nothing but emotional distress and the jury would have seen that. This wouldn't have gained her any favor from the men and women who would decide her fate. Well, I, I, again, they, first of all, in the hearsay objection, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and you're going to hear testimony about things that Mr. Woodworth may have said and things that he may have wrote, and they're allowed in this case not for the truth of what he wrote or what he said. And this is, this is a difficult concept, I think. And you'll get an instruction at the close of the case and how, why this evidence is uh, admitted and why it is allowed. Um, and uh, so, it, again, it's, and lawyers understand this, and hear it all the time, but it's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted, but only offered as it goes to the context uh, and, and, and the state of mind Ms. McCandless may have had and how that, what she heard or read affected her. And so, um, now, the second issue, um, what, I guess... Can we approach her on? Yeah, okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the objection is sustained on, on relevance, um, and so Ms. Vishnu will continue. All right, I want to ask you some questions about Alex and his feelings. Um, all right. All right, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an essay that you <coughs> I'm showing you again from Exhibit 697 an uh, essay called Words, dated November 6, 26, excuse me, 2016. Yes. All right. So, again, looking at the typed and the handwritten pages, have you had an ability to look at them before and compare them? Yes. And are they, is the typed version just make it easier to read? Yes. Okay. Um, now, this essay was written before Alex met you, but have you read this essay? Yes, I have. And have you discussed it with Alex? Yes. Is this the typed version of the essay called Words? Yes. All right. Looking at the second paragraph of that essay, can you read the second paragraph? Are you speaking of the paragraph that starts with yet? 
No, this paragraph that starts with do I wish. Do right I on the top. So I've... All right, would you like me to read this? Yes, please. Do I wish, desire to die? In a way, yes, in another, no. For the first, life is misery, each day the same, exhausting. For the second, a wager of experiences that outweigh any present pain. The former is inexplicable. The latter is need of comment. Okay, the next paragraph. There is little I've enjoyed more than the physical intimacy. The contact under covers list watching a film, for example. These have a way of grounding a shattered conscience. Regardless of any euphoria of reflection, her presence, her breath against me, the heaves of her chest cement me, pull me back together. Indeed, bliss is her heart beat felt. All right. Now, fair to say those words are not written about you. This journal is written before he met you. Y yes. Did he express uh, similar feelings towards you uh, eventually in your relationship? Definitely. Direction relevance. Uh, I'm an overrule. Go ahead. Yes, he did. All right. Before we continue, the next portion of the direct examination will be dedicated to going over a lot of Alex's philosophical musings, with Ezra and her legal team giving their own explanations as to what he was saying. However, one of the biggest issues that we will come across is the fact that she will read his writings and discern meaning that isn't explicitly stated. Because Alex wrote in an academic, esoteric way, he often wrote essays that didn't have an exact point or a conclusion. Take his journal on cannibalism, where he is saying he is fascinated with it in concept. He isn't fighting for or against cannibalism. He's just saying the concept of taking over a person so fully that they are inside of you is interesting. That's it. Or this paper, where he is talking about how he both wants and doesn't want to die. He is simply reflecting on his own suffering in life, how at times he feels incredibly low and cannot think of a way forward, but at other times he feels joy. Though he uses complex language, his writings tend to amount to very obvious conclusions, but the erudite, flowery words allows for Ezra and her legal team to expand on his words in a way that feels incredibly disingenuous. And does he continue in this essay to talk about depression? Yes. What does he say at the top of this page, starting with the word or? Or, in formula, my emptiness is what prevents any feel fulfillment. Or again, my misery blocks any happiness from occurring. Yet again, my illness makes a cure unattainable. And, How, okay, go ahead. You can How go. sad, huh? Does he talk in this essay about philosophy and how that helps him? Yes. What does he say about that? You can just summarize it if you remember it. Philosophy is kind of a vessel for him. And by a vessel, what do you mean? A vessel for is what I considered pain. Okay. Does Did he say that philosophy was like a way out or something that he yes. could escape into? And at the very end, in his essay, after he talks about escaping into it, what does he say? He says... And so, starting with those words. And so... Do you mean pity me? No, the paragraph before that. All right. And so, my attempt to escape is futile. I am trapped by the very trapped I was caught by, the longing to be otherwise that alone. Yet, that is what I am, alone. My loneliness even prevents socialization. Too many times I have heard, you didn't look like you wanted to talk entirely because I longed for that very connection I failed to even be recognized as feeling alone because of how alone I fell. Pity me, I refuse to utter such words. Instead, my only hope is to be as alone as I feel, so I can. Thank you. Were there other times that Alex Woodworth wrote about being lonely, empty, and misery? 
Did that theme continue in his writings? It continued, yes. Okay. Um, you this first before I get to the themes of loneliness and misery in his writing yes did your relationship eventually change from being friends and confidants who went on walks and discussed philosophy into something else yes why don't you tell us about that Alex and I it started slow. We we held hands, we hugged, and we shared a few kisses, and then eventually we became partners. This romantic version of events she is laying out doesn't sit right with me, especially when I have read the journals she wrote and sent to Jason in order to win him back. She regarded Alex as an abusive manipulator who took advantage of her in a moment of weakness in order to have sex with her. During the sexual assault investigation, she said this about him. Had any sexual intercourse with anyone else after since this incident? After me and Jason broke up, after I after what happened with John, I went over to a friend's house to talk to them about what happened, and I was just hanging out with them and talking to them, and then they just they wanted to just after they were like, well, you can just forget it if you just, you know, sleep with me. You can just forget all about it. So I was like, I don't know what to do. I guess this is fine. Okay. Who was that? That was just someone named Alex. I don't even, I don't talk to them anymore or anything. So was it, just, was it just Alex that you had sex with that night? Yeah. I just had relations with Alex because he said that he loved me and that he'll take care of me now. And that he's my best friend, and I can trust him. And I said, okay, I guess. Okay. Even though it didn't it hurt. And in her interview with Proc, after she killed Alex, she claimed that Alex had never opened up to her and had manipulated her into opening up to him. So her taking the stand and attempting to convey that she viewed him as an equal, someone who she deeply cared for, is incredibly Machiavellian. But she's already done that with a number of other people in this case. She will claim to deeply care for and love someone, all the while leveling heinous accusations towards them. It's disturbing to watch. And was this, were you still living with Jason during this time? Yes. Um, when you say you became partners, can you just explain what kind of partner you mean? S sexual partners. Okay. Um, and did he express desires for you to be vulnerable to him? Absolutely, yes. I'm going to show you another uh, essay of his. I'm just waiting to get it out of the book. Yes. Okay. of this essay in quotes it says come as you are flaws and all what's the date that this essay was written October 29th 2017 and again is the type version the same as the handwritten version yes Looking at the very top of this essay, come as you are. Yes. Okay. I just want to ask you, without having you read the whole top, you notice that he talks about Caputo, Abraham, and God. And, yes. And the Abrahamic story of Isaac and sacrifice. Is that what that relates to? Yes, it does. Okay. And was Caputo... Um, or just tell tell us about Alex and Caputo or that that book. Was that a book he was fond of? He was very fond of that book. It was a staple in his reading and his philosophies. Okay. 
um, does he also in this the last sentence in this paragraph mentions if I'll, I'll just read it for you alongside the obligatory I want to find a poetics of erotics did he connect Caputo philosophy and eroticism yes Objection, leading I don't think that's leading I just asked if he connected them Preliminary I'm, question. Okay, I'll give you a little attitude, so I'm going to Thank overrule. You. But it okay. is it is leading. What what do you mean by that when you say he connected those things? What I mean by that is that he wanted to explore them in his concepts of erotics. He wanted to explore the stories from Caputo and the novel about Abraham. Okay, and going. To he, later down the page, all right, as yes. it continues, I'm going to ask you specifically, and I'm trying to make this easier for you to read than, so you don't have to search. Thank you. Okay. Can you read that paragraph that starts with Here I Am? Here I am, come as you are, flaws and all. I wager myself and invite you to risk yourself. All right, just stop right there. Do you know what he's writing about in this essay on October 29th? Yes, I do. How do you know? I know because come as you are, flaws and all, was a discussion we had between each other often. It was something he would say to me, he would text to me, and ask of me all of the time. Okay. And go ahead and keep reading that. All I... All of this is needed. I cannot command you to come unless I risk the same. In this phrase, I occupy both the Abrahamic, here I am, and the divine, come. If either parts fails, erotics fails, even if it succeeds. All right, keep going. If I do not risk myself, I reveal the desire to possess. I am seducing, not loving. If I do not invite you to risk yourself, I become the ethical fool, the willing sacrifice. I am committed, but to someone who doesn't love me. What's he talking about there, committed, but to someone who doesn't love him? Objection. Sustained. For speculation. Did he discuss with you what that line meant, that he's committed, but to somebody who doesn't love me? Yes. We had this discussion, as we did in many of our discussions about, that I was still in a relationship essentially with Jason. So he felt that because I was still in that relationship, I was not fully committed to just him. Because you weren't. You were in a relationship with a whole other person. This essay ends with him saying, we hide our flaws and it is a feat to come flaws and all. Have you actually responded? Do you know what he's referring to there? Yes. Okay. Can you tell the jury that? What he is saying there is that it's hard to bear yourself to someone completely, to be vulnerable. I, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Sorry. I was out, he asked me to be vulnerable with him, to essentially come to him flaws and all. And I've often struggled bearing my flaws easily and openly. So it was... This discussion in this essay we read together was about how I was and trying to bear myself to him and as he was asking, because he bared himself to me, that I should do the same. Now, let's talk a little bit more about your relationship and its development. So this is written in late October. Yes. In that time, in October, just what's the status of your relationship with him yet? Is it sexual? Is it on its way to being sexual? What's going on? It's, at that time, we were becoming intimate, yes. We were very much so falling in love at that time. And, um, did there come a time where you spent the night at his house? Yes. Do you remember roughly when that first time was? E roughly, yes, I do remember. Okay, why don't you tell us? It was late October. Could it have November. been the beginning of October? 
Oh, uh, yes. I, I'm sorry, not late October. Could it be Beginning of November. That's what I meant to say. Yes. I'm getting a little confused. All right. And um, was Jason out of town when that happened? Yes, he was. Okay. Um, you've seen Alex's roommates come in and testify, his yes. former roommates? Yes. All right. Um, was Dave Stroiding a roommate at that time? Yes, he was. Had you ever met him? No. Or we kind of avoided each other. Okay. And what about the other roommate, Matt Schreiner? Did he eventually become a roommate too? Or was he, he was a, a He was a roommate at the time, yes. And did you socialize with him at all? Off and on, we had socialized. We met each other at the coffee shop a few times. Okay. Um, so when you... Um, stayed over with him. Tell us how your relationship was developing at that time. At that time, it was becoming very intimate, is how I can describe it. We have be we at that time had become sexual partners, and we were sharing with each other a lot of ourselves. Despite the fact that you were close and sharing things, yes. was Alex still writing in a way that reflected and talking to you in a way that reflected misery or depression or unhappiness? Or yes, he was. I'm showing you an essay in Exhibit 697 yes. called The Failure to Write, dated December 21st, 2017. Yes. Are you familiar with that essay? Yes. And is it the same as the handwritten? Is the type version the same as the handwritten? Yes. Now, in this essay, without reading, can you tell us or, or just, I mean, not reading the whole thing. The paragraph that says, this is supposed to help my misery. Can you, can you read that paragraph? Yes. This is supposed to help ease my misery, but it only draws it into reflection. I want to say so much to you, but I cannot bring myself to speak. The words, if said to you, would only hurt more. They would hurt you and exacerbate, exuberate my own pain. Is that exacerbate? Exacerbate. That, that's okay. Then the words that he says after that, he goes on. Can you read that? I know that I am not your priority. I am secondary to you. I believe that you love me, but your love for another is what you place your faith in. I am loved, but in a way that you can always give up. You believe that things can get better with the love you prioritize, and that means you believe you will abandon me someday. I am in so much pain because you love me, and, y and still you hope to abandon me to my loneliness again. Can you see that your desire for your priority is also a desire for my annihilation? Can I show you this? Or is my only hope to be that your priority ceases to be so far the development of my own significance? Can you realize that I am your significant other in a way that I benefit from? Now, this essay was written on December 21st, 2017. Yes. Okay, we're going to come back in a little bit to something that happened in December of 2017. Actually, I'm going to show you another essay. This is from December 26th, 2017. Yes. What is the title of that essay? An Obsession with Misery, December 26, 2017. Okay. And um, is this the typed version again? Is it the same as the handwritten? Yes. <coughs> okay, this is short. Yes. Okay, why don't you read this? All right. Alongside my obsession with erotics, I am possessed to write about misery, the failing of happy consciousness. In all honesty, suffering is among my greatest interests. Okay, I'm going to... Okay, just go ahead. Keep going. I am in love with the feminology of illness, both mental and physical, but also with the sub-pathological suffering. The plight of a guilty woman who is sexually promiscuous interests me as much as those with cancer. 
depression, and dysphoria. The anxiety of perfectionism, of a short prognosis of lifelong uncurable symptoms is a game as that is an overworked college student with a cumulative final, each differs from the others. But that there is misery remains constant. Love has been interwoven into my life, but so has object misery been. I recall my first okay. love. I, I'm going to stop you okay. there because um, he is talking. Did he discuss this essay with you? Yes. And he goes on in the essay to talk about other people and their misery? Yes, he does. All right. And do you know, or did he talk to you about why he was writing about misery at near the end of December? He was himself feeling a lot of internal pain and loneliness, even well as we had a relationship together. It's because you were in a relationship with a whole other person, Ezra. Her recounting these events are so entirely clinical, it's almost as if she was a third party to what occurred. But she is talking about a person she claims to have loved, and how her being in another relationship at the time deeply hurt him. Though he is writing in a scholarly fashion about the relationship, what he is saying is clear. I am hurt because you won't break up with your boyfriend, who you don't even like. But her addition that he is dealing with a profound sense of loneliness, despite the fact that they were in a relationship, is so entirely out of touch. His feelings make complete sense. He spelled it out as plainly as possible. So let me ask you, when you first met him, we, we talked about this a little earlier. Yes. And he was writing about cannibalism, right? Yes, he was. All right. Do you recall, did that theme continue in his discussions with you? Often, yes. And did he write about that in some of his other essays? Yes. Um, this is an essay going back to August of 2017. What's the name of this essay? Dead to Me. And the date? August 6, 2017. Is the type version the same as the handwritten? Yes. And looking at, I'll get this up to the right place, one minute, to say I'm not great at using this Elmo. This essay, can you just read the first sentence of that paragraph? Yes. Because you are dead to me, this love fails to truly be, fails to be truly erotic now though it may have been. Instead, we are speaking of cannibalism. Again, to be clear, when he says cannibalism, he's using it as a metaphorical sense, the idea of devouring another person's essence and them being all-consuming. He's not talking about literally eating a person. We should not have to clarify that. All right. So, <coughs> besides cannibalism in his writings, aside from that, this is in August, we've already talked about it, Yes. Did he continue to have these discussions with you about cannibalism beyond writing about them? All of the time, yes. What, what would he, did, did his expressions or his talks about cannibalism go beyond the esoteric or the philosophical it, from what you heard from him? Yes. Why don't you tell us about that? It would it went beyond philosophy at points when we would discuss erotics of cannibalism and cannibalism in the sense of individuals in history and through the past and even artists who have take, partaken in cannibalism because of their ultimate de desire to consume that individual, to consume that individual's power or to consume that individual so that that person they had loved would never leave them. So, in other words, I, I'm not quite understanding what you mean. The person that they loved would never leave them. Could you just explain a little bit more what, what yes. Alex told you and what he meant about that? We specifically spoke of individuals, lovers, that partook in cannibalism, and he consumed his partner so that, in essence, by consuming his partner eating him, 
because he was passed away, he was never away from him. He had absorbed his essence. What is the title of the essay? essay? Violation. And the date? August 9th, 2017. So, again, is he writing about you in this essay? No. Okay. So, I'm going to show you just a brief part of this essay. In this essay, is he discussing a prior relationship with him? Yes. All right. Can you read this where it says distract me? Yes. Distract me is dehumanize, dehumanizing, unhuman. It is the request of a mind to flesh. It is cannibalism. The words haunt me, confirming that you had died to me. I was lift with a revenant. A fa facsimile? facsimile? A facsimile of a person who spoke of a warm caress while offering a vampire touch. Now, in that essay, when he said, I was lift with a remnant, first of all, in your discussions with him, was lift actually intended to be left? I was left with a remnant? Yes. Okay, that's what I'm asking about. All right. And in that discussion, can you explain what a revenant, or, or not what it is necessarily, but what Alex said a revenant was? Yes, we often talked about a revenant. When we would speak of a revenant, or a revenant, we would discuss how it, essentially what a revenant is, is an individual come back from the dead, a specter or a ghost of sorts. They have come back to do unfinished business, or it is called like retribution, or it's unfinished business essentially is what a revenant comes back for. It was a topic we often talked about because he would tell me he considered himself a revenant. And again, from exhibit 697, I'm showing you an, another essay. Yes. And can you tell the jury what the title, why don't you tell me what the title is here of this essay and the date? From the Past, Memories, November 2017, reworked from July 24th, 2017. Again, is the typed the same as the handwritten? Yes. I'm going to ask you to read it from where it says, I know now. It Just the next few sentences. I know now that you wanted to change me and be changed by me. You asked for my flesh. I'm sorry, I had that a little. Thank you. You asked for my flesh and offered me yours, both, but so that we could give and receive back new flesh. I am yours, become mine. I mistook the innocent play, your desire for my hunger. I saw cannibalism where you asked to be seen erotically. Okay, let's stop there. When he says, I saw cannibalism when he s you asked to be seen erotically, do you know what he's writing about? Objection calls for speculation. Sustained. Did you discuss with Alex what he was writing about? Yes. Why don't you tell us what that was about? When I discussed this with Alex, he was speaking of, he was taking the other person in, he was consuming them wholly. Were they seen, where they wanted to be seen erotically, lovingly, he was seeing them as something to take in, to possess. Did Alex tell you whether or not that reference was about you? Yes. And what did he say? He told me that it was in reference of me because of parallels of someone he was with in the past. I'm going to show you again the beginning of the same essay. Yes. Um, let me get it to this. Can you read this? I am warm. I am kind. I am good. When did it when did I become so dull inside? I am not warm. I am so gloomy. I am not kind. I am so distant. I'm not good. I'm aberrant. I have aberrant got, is that aberrant? Aberrant. Okay. I have gotten too good at being these things. Am I seen as a good as a person anymore? 
They aren't masks, though. All right, let me ask you about there where he's saying he's aberrant and it's not a mask. Can you explain, or did you, Alex discuss with you what he meant by that? He discussed with me about masks often. Can you tell me what he would tell you about masks? Or not tell me, tell all of us. Yes. What he told me about masks is that he often seen others and he often felt himself that he had to put on a mask to present himself a certain way so that when he was out in public or when he was at work, he would put on a certain face. And often he felt that it was always hard to always have to wear a mask with certain people. All right. In the same essay, yes. I'm going to go to one more area. All right. And I'll direct you over to the words, my touch. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay. Why don't you read that? My touch is a request. Feel nothing but me. Let me give death a face to you. Has my body ever taken someone's from there and gave it back different? I remember holding her with my coat, warming her already too human face. Did it consume her as she did me? Or was my futile attempt to possess but kindling? I am not warm, but I can offer myself to your blaze. Okay, I'll ask you to stop there. Again, did Alex discuss with you what he meant? And I want to ask specifically about where he says, let me give death a face to you. Do you. Did he talk about that with you? He did talk about that with me. And what did he mean? He wasn't, he wasn't talking about death as in looking at the other individual and he's seen death. He was, in essence, speaking of how loving that individual was as death. It is, it's, it's a hard thing to just outright and say. Okay. In this essay, he is talking about his anxieties surrounding love and how love invariably changes a person. The death that he is talking about is the death of the person they were before they fell in love, and how he is anxious to be changed. He's not literally killing the person or eating them, or cannibalizing them, or using his body as a kindling for a fire. It's that simple. But even when trying to explain the writing to us, the plebeian, uneducated masses, Ezra struggles to put the concept into simple words. Us being these unwashed rogues, who are obviously completely uneducated, just wouldn't understand, I guess. As we mentioned earlier, because Alex wrote his journals in such a metaphorical way, she deciphers these essays in a way that just feels dishonest and self-serving. His emotional response to her choosing not to break up with Jason, his feelings about being secondary to another man, all of that has been written off and made to seem as if it was unimportant or a sign of mental defect on his part. Her interpreting these journals at all didn't seem to help the defense's case, either. She came off as incredibly smug and overly confident, as if the general population wouldn't be able to properly decipher the texts without her expert knowledge. Pair that with the fact that she had a hard time reading the journals at all and interpreted them wrong. The majority of people who have watched her testimony were left feeling more convinced of her guilt. Um... I want to ask you about the sexual aspects of your relationship with Alex during this time, meaning late October, November, December. All, All right. right. So during this period of time, can you tell us some of the, and um, I know it's very intimate, but some of the it details is. of your sexuality or the sexuality or sex between you and Alex Woodworth? Alex and I, when we began our relationship, sex was very vanilla, I could say. It what was, does vanilla mean? Well, Just in case people haven't heard that expression. What vanilla means is that it was your, your average sex. It was missionary. You're, you're what a lot of people would describe as normal sex. Okay. And during this period of time, 
were, was there some progression from the pure vanilla into yes. some differences early now, November, December? Yes, there were. I encouraged him to explore himself and things he might want. And he started, we started practicing and doing these new things that he wanted to express himself. Okay. First of all, in terms of sexual position, was there a preferred sexual position from Alex's po that Alex told you he preferred? Yes. What was that? It was called prone, as he informed me. And were you face to face during sex? No, rarely. Okay. What position were you in? From behind is what you can call it. He would often express this desire for it. And were there objects he would use uh, that impaired your sight at all? Yes, he, he preferred to have my glasses off and he enjoyed to blindfold me. Um, was there uh, anything specific about lightness versus darkness? Yes, he he liked it to be either soft light, a candle, or he preferred it to be absolutely dark. He enjoyed kind of the mystery of it all in the dark. How did you feel about that? I thought it was interesting and exciting, and I also felt... I am very visually impaired without my glasses, so I get a little uncomfortable at times without them. So, let me ask this. Did Alex refer to you as a boy? Yes. Do you know why he referred you to you as a boy, did he tell you why? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Objection, relevance. <coughs> I'm going to go ahead. Again, we, we, there's a limited purpose. For, yes, this is for her feelings. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this has been out there quite a bit already in front of the All jury. Right. All right. What were your feelings, or, or what did he tell you about him referring to you as a boy? Well, as our relationship progressed, um, I told him about how I identified in the past as almost strictly masculine. And he, he preferred that I presented myself in a masculine way. He often told me how confident I looked and how much he was attracted to me because he could call me a boy, his boy, and present that way. Did you present yourself as a male to Alex? Yes, I did. What about the word boy specifically? How did you feel about his use of the word boy? The word boy specifically, at first it was gender, as you can call it, but then the word became more possessive. I was his boy. It felt objectifying at times. And what do you mean by objectifying? I felt as if I was an object, that I was not Ezra Candelis, essentially, but I was just his boy. In their messages, Ezra stated that she enjoyed being called boy by Alex because it made her feel strong and appreciated. She cited how other people in the past had been cruel about how she had previously identified herself as a boy, and his pride in it made her feel seen and cared for. Boy and my boy were used as pet names by Alex something that he did to feel closer to Ezra and to make their relationship feel more unique when compared to her relationships with other people. Her choosing in this moment to recontextualize this pet name as being somehow hurtful and objectifying is deeply dishonest. The fact that she is directly smiling at the jury while recounting this is also incredibly off-putting. Every time she looks over to her right, she's staring at the jury, and it's in these moments that she seems the most rehearsed. essays from a book called Personal Notes and Research Ideas of the Quest to Understand. Right? Yes. And um, I inadvertently, I didn't realize that 
the original was not in evidence. So I'm showing you what's been marked. Oops, is exhibit 698? Uh, yes. Is that the orange notebook that contains those essays you've testified about? Yes. Thank no you. No objection to its admission, Your Honor. All right. And what's that exhibit 698? Yes. Okay. Exhibit 698 will be received. Again, subject to uh, court's pretrial rulings. Now, I've also been showing you what was previously marked as number, I believe, 653. I just want to make sure. And this is a copy of the book, the original of the book, called Extra Scriber. Yes. I'm going to ask you to please turn to page 32 in this book. Or maybe I'll do it for you just to make it. Mm -hmm. So first of all, are there page numbers at the bottom of each page? Yes. All right. Um, on page 32, do you see a doodle at the bottom of that page? Yes. What is that doodle? Sorry. Um, this doodle is a dog. Okay. Who drew it? I did. Do you remember when you drew it? <laughs> yes. Can you tell the jury when you drew it? I drew it when we were together sharing a cup of coffee and he was writing and I was reading as he was writing. All right. And this is the first time Ezra has shown any emotion besides some sort of dreamy happiness. She tears up, not when discussing Alex or his life, but when looking at a doodle of a dog that she drew in his journal. And turning to page 41 in the journal, is there a doodle at the bottom of page 41? Yes. And when did you doodle that? I doodled this when we were together yet again, and it's a bug of sorts. All right. And then turning to page 181, <coughs> at the bottom of page 181, is there another doodle? Yes, there is. And when did you doodle that? I doodled this yet again when we were spending time together, and he was explaining to me, and we were talking back and forth about this essay. Okay, thank you. I don't have any further questions about your doodles. Thank you. An extra scriber. Ezra thanks her lawyer for ending the line of questioning about her drawings with a large sigh, as if this was the most painful part of what she has had to testify to. But an hour prior, she was accusing her father of being emotionally abusive towards her when she was young. So much so, she developed a coping strategy of blacking out. And she also accused her ex-boyfriend of being incredibly controlling as well as emotionally abusive. But looking at her drawings in Alex's notebook was a bridge too far. I'm showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 651. Is this another journal of yes. Alex Woodworth? Yes. And just, just what's the name of that journal? This journal, it's notes, October 19th, 2017 through Dream Tea, Tree, Simple and Elegant. And turning to the first page, is there a doodle at the bottom of that page? Yes. Did you draw that? Yes. Do it's you remember when you drew it? Yes, I remember when he asked me to read this and I drew a pumpkin with some hearts. Uh, uh, page 25. Is there a doodle on page 25? Yes, a cat. All right, page 27. Is there a doodle on page 27? Yes, a doodle of a peach. Page 32. Yes, this is a fox. And page 35? Yes, there's a doodle. All right, and were all of those doodles drawn when you were with Alex Woodworth at times he was talking about the pages on the journal? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what was previously marked as exhibit number 654. Oh, you almost on it? Okay. I'm going to show you this book. Let me try and get the whole 
book in. Oops. Bearing in mind that I'm not great at this. Okay. Okay, I'm showing you what's been previously been marked, I think, as exhibit number 654. Yes. Um, what is this? Sison Kierkegaard, Fear and Trembling. Um, this particular book, did Alex discuss this book with you much? We discussed it often, and we s discussed it the most during very intimate moments of our relationship. I want you to <coughs> explain to the jury what you mean by him discussing them during intimate moments in your relationship. This book was the book he would read from as we were having sex, and he would read passages from this book. I... All right, then. Was there another book he also read passages from when you were engaged in sex with Alex? Yes, he would read from Caputo. Hope. Do, do you know what the name of that book is? Hoping Against Hope. That we were talking about Alex referring to you as boy a little bit earlier. Yes. Did he also write about that in his journals? He did, yes. And I'm going to show you an essay from his journals. That's one minute. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get the right part. All right. I think we were talking about boy, and I'm going to show you a journal entry and ask you what the name of that entry is. Yes. When I lost myself, November 29th through 30th, 2017. Is it fair to say this is a pretty long essay? Yes. Okay. And is uh, have you looked at the handwritten compared to the typed, and are they the same? Yes, I have. Okay. How many typed pages are there in this essay? I guess I should ask you that first before yes. I go to it. There are 31 typed pages. Do you mean there are five typed pages, number 27? Oh. 31. <laughs> yes. Is that a mistake? I was reading the bottom number. Okay. Instead of counting, but there are five. Okay. I'm not going to go through this whole essay with you. Yes. Um, I just want to ask you one thing that's in the essay. On the second to last page, or page four of the type version of the essay, can you please read that? Yes. I do not mean to, stay, to say that he is irrational for not running away with me. Rather, I mean his hopes for a potential. I fail to understand his love for an abusive partner, at least in ways specifically understand the desire for stability. All the more so because of his friendships are mediated by this relationship. To give up his current partner is to risk losing his friends. Furthermore, I understand his feelings of guilt. Guilty. This issue is my lack of sympathy. I do not see what there is to feel guilty about. He cannot do as he wants, and thus there is no love. If he did as he wanted, even without doing evil, the relationship would end. There is no love. Love is not happening, and yet he loves. I do not understand, but still I hope to be understanding. Did Alex Woodward discuss this journal entry with you? Yes. And that particular part which is referenced, what did he say to you about that? 
Well, when he was writing this very long journal, he pointed this out that he had been writing about me, and I noticed that instead of saying as you might she or her, he was saying my masculine pronoun, his, him. He was talking about kind of his desires for our relationship and how he desired for my other relationship to end. Pausing here for a moment, because we need to go over multiple parts of this portion, though Ezra's lawyer didn't mean to, she accidentally showed a portion of the essay prior to the paragraph that Ezra read out, and this portion completely discredits the argument that they will be making about Alex in this case. It reads, What does concretely mean? A more contemporary instance serves to prove a point. I've recently fallen for a young man who is in a rather unhealthy relationship. I don't believe I'm doing evil. I suspect that I might even be doing good. But this means that even if only the former holds, I can really do whatever I will, so long as that is not evil. It gives me an uncanny confidence, almost bravado. Still, I find a shortcoming that indicates need for further growth, namely a lack of concern for the other's irrationality. This passage will become relevant later on, but in it, Alex is stating that though he feels that the purpose of living is to do whatever you will, and the purpose of loving is to love a person even at their worst, he has a personal sense of good and evil, and he will not cross those boundaries. Moreover, when Ezra describes this passage, she is clearly incredibly happy to be written about this way. She greatly enjoys the fact that Alex felt this way about her, despite the fact that she is arguing in court that she was deeply afraid of him and that she was justified in killing him. The pleasure she takes in reading and explaining this passage about herself not only goes against the characterization she is making of Alex, but also goes against the fact that she claimed that Alex referring to her by masculine pronouns felt uncomfortable and objectifying. Was there a particular phrase that Alex, a philosophical phrase that Alex frequently used? Yes, he would often say to me, love and do as you will. And in your mind? Yes. What, in your mind, well, first let me ask you this. What did Alex say that that meant to him? He said to me, in what I took from what we talked about, that this love and do as you will was a way to say, I will do what I want, I will love who I want, I will do what I need to do in love. And that essentially is he will take what he wants. In Alex's writing, love and do what you will is his way of saying that he loves and accepts people for how they are in a complete sense. Ezra being in a relationship with another person, one who she refuses to break up with, he accepts that completely and loves her regardless because if he were to force her to change, then he believes that that wouldn't be love. Although it made him feel poorly, all of his writing was about accepting that for what it is, and being understanding towards her, as well as moving forward and accepting that fact. So, if you were in a relationship with someone dealing with substance abuse issues, he believed that you should love them without expecting them to change. And if you tried to push them down that path, then that technically wasn't love in his worldview. In turn, he expected that kind of undiscerning, unflinching love back. And anything but complete and utter acceptance of a person's faults and flaws, he considered not to be love. He would write about his past relationships, and how an ex had wanted him to be more outgoing, and how that request was a sign that their love had died. It had nothing to do with taking without asking, or, as Ezra will later claim, negating consent. It's almost like she was convinced that the jury wouldn't be able to read, or if they had never heard of a metaphor before. I'm showing you an essay about love and do what you will. What is it called? Delige et quad vis fact. Do you know what language that is? I believe it's French. Okay. Regardless of what language it is, because I don't know, um, do you know what it translates to? Love and do as you will. All right. What's the date that this essay was written? November 9th, 2017. By this time, and is it the same as the type handwritten version? Yes. All right. By this time, was your sexual relationship with Alex um, 
had you had sexual intercourse by this time? Yes, we had had sexual intercourse by that time. Okay. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to ask you to read the whole essay. Yes. Um, but I'm going to ask specifically about this third paragraph and where it says, please forgive me. Okay. Can you read that part, That just those two sentences? Yes. Please forgive me for moving like you. You who are so alive. I profane the very breaths I take, an undead hoping to pass for something other than conscious, than a conscious corpse. My guilt is wanting love without having a heart. And the next sentence? I've half-heartedly tried to isolate myself from you, afraid I would taint you. Okay, and then on, I'm going to move down. I'm going to move down to the end of the page. Okay, I'm off the screen. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm going to get it on the screen because when I look down, it looks like it's on the screen, but it's not. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, this last paragraph. Can you read that? Yes. I was further contaminated. This all mutated. I wanted to be happy but felt unworthy. I wanted to be loved, but refused to believe it possible. I wanted to be alive, but lacked a heart. And you hurt me. I hated myself through you, and you were a living death. Everything I said came to be a lie. I had to escape the monster I became with you. You did not deserve it, nor did I. Do you? Did Alex talk to you about what he's referring to when he says, I had to become the monster? I had to escape the monster I became with you? Yes. What is that? In this conversation, we discussed how he felt, how we were continuing our relationship sexually, intimately, how he f wearing the masks to everyone else. And what do you mean by masks? And you, you just explain that. Wearing the masks as to seem a certain way with everyone, let's say, out in public, but underneath the mask, there was a lot hidden. All right, I'm going to ask you about one other line in this essay. This is near the end of the essay. Yes. And again, we're not going to read the whole thing but I just would ask you to read the top sentence. I am, I am still afraid of myself, afraid I will come out again and hurt someone. Now, when he said that, did you discuss what he meant by he was afraid he would come out and hurt someone? Yes. Okay. And continuing with that paragraph, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Nelson wants to say something. Why don't you tell the jury what he said to you about him saying he was afraid he would come out and hurt someone? What he said to me about this in our discussion is he said to me how he was afraid he was going to take all. He was going to be greedy in the sense that he was, if he wanted something, he was going to get what he wanted. That is demonstrably false. Once again, the lawyer accidentally left the paragraph before the passage she read uncovered, as well as the remainder of the passage. I'll read it to you now and we can assess what it means together. But remember, we are not as smart and philosophically inclined as Ezra is. So brace yourselves and put on your helmets. I've moved on my own, alive now. That is why I write I in lowercase. There is an active forgetting I call forgiveness. Now I forgive myself for living. I am guilty. I don't deserve, and I say, I forget about it. Live, please, be happy, live. Now, I forget about myself. I lost myself. I am still afraid of myself. Afraid I will come out again and hurt someone. Afraid I will use someone for redemption and self-mutilation. But I will love 
and I will love myself, forgive myself, and love you always. I am no longer myself. I don't know who I am, so let me apologize and forgive myself for becoming something new. These are dreams, hopes against hope, paradise without history, yet I find them beautifully fantastic. Love and do what you will, that is the prayer I wept for, the sole motion of the good I now live with. It keeps me up at night. I don't know if I can love anymore. It may be myself, my urge to find external forgiveness, my habit of using and hurting someone to get back at myself. I come with a history. Yet, despite my insomnia, I dream that I may just mean it. Maybe, perhaps, I can forget myself and sincerely love you. I have no choice in the matter. I am not myself. So I can only hope against hope. Pray. That is, that you will risk loving me because maybe I mean it, and if, if I do, anything goes. We can do and be what we want. Will you risk happiness with me? Knowing, based on his past writing, that he uses you with an uppercase Y to refer to Ezra, he is clearly talking about how he loves her and wants to be with her, fully, as her actual boyfriend, and not simply as the other man in the scenario. He's dealing with his own complex emotions around hurting Ezra by putting her in this position to choose between Jason and himself and through this love triangle, his very sense of self has been challenged. He doesn't know who he is anymore because he is trying to be who she wants, and he directly states that his sole belief in the concept of love and do what you will has been deeply shaken because he wants to change Ezra and convince her to make a decision already. Alex goes so far as to say that he now doesn't know if what he feels for Ezra even qualifies as love because he wants her to change. This passage is decidedly not about Alex taking whatever he wanted without caring for anyone outside of himself. That is the literal opposite of what the passage indicates, and unless you mean to tell the world that when Alex wrote in his journal he purposely lied about what he felt and thought, then Ezra is lying. But that's not surprising as she lies about literally everything. I'm going to refer you back to an earlier part of the essay, more in the beginning, that I forgot to read you, or yes. forgot to ask you to read. Yes. Um, so let me just make sure I have that on there, where it says, I've half-heartedly. Yes. I've half-heartedly tried to isolate myself from you, afraid I would taint you, yet I love you. I am sorry for this failure on my part. I know my touch would kill you, yet I reach out. That is my sin the violence of my flesh that I lack a soul to correct. Okay, now did he discuss that with you specifically? Yes. What did he tell you about that? What he told me about this is that in our relationship, I expressed a lot of my anxieties and my uncertainties with my previous relationship, continuing relationship with Jason. He was expressing to me that he knew it was causing me anxiety to pursue this, to keep pursuing this relationship and what we were doing. And he told me that at this point it was that he didn't really necessarily care anymore that he was causing this anxiety, that he was going to reach out anyways to me, that he was going to continue our relationship because that's what he wanted. I'm going to leave the passage on the screen if you would like to read it, but I will summarize what it states. In this passage, Alex is writing about how in love with Ezra he is. He describes her as bringing love into his life and making him want to continue living, that he is indebted to her, and scared of his feelings and how their love will change them. Notice how Ezra's interpretation of the passage, where Alex writes about being so desperately in love with her, as him knowing that she was uncomfortable continuing the affair that she had started, and that he simply didn't care. He was going to keep seeing her, despite her anxiety, because that's what he wanted. Which, that is simply untrue. But moreover, the one time Ezra told Alex that she no longer wanted to see him, that she was done with the relationship, and that she didn't want to talk to him anymore, he respected her wishes. He didn't ask for an explanation, or inquire as to what happened. When she put up a boundary, he immediately respected it. Ezra had never stated she wanted their relationship to end, and willingly chose to keep it going. She was spending the majority of her time with Alex, telling him that she wanted to break up with Jason, that Jason was nothing compared to him, and that Jason had become controlling and abusive towards her. His writing quite sincerely says the opposite of what she is trying to portray. Now, did there come a time where Alex cut his wrist? Yes. Um, can you tell the jury about that? There had been a time when I received some messages from Alex saying that he had harmed himself. 
I was, he was asking me if I could drive him to a pharmacy or to help him out with this. And Jason at the time was, he asked me about it and I told him Alex was hurt and Jason wanted to help. So I had gone over to Alex's house to help him and that is when I seen what had happened and Jason had patched him up as he said. When you say you saw what had happened, can you please describe that to the jury? What I saw had, had happened was he had slit his wrist and he shown me that he had to use a t-shirt to kind of stifle the bleeding. And it was just a very ugly gash from what I looked at. At a later date, did Alex tell you first of all at that time when you were there with Jason did he say if you remember yes. what he said about cutting his wrist what he said to me about cutting his wrist is that he felt he was feeling depressed again and that he felt like he was feeling dead inside did he tell you that in front of Jason or did he tell you that at a later date he told me that not in front of Jason but kind of to the side he pulled me to the side when we were talking And again, I'm showing you another essay by Alex Woodworth from exhibit number 697. What is this essay called? This essay is called Between Two Hands, January 20th through 22nd, 2018. Is it the same as the handwritten version, the typed version? Yes. Is this in evidence? Yes. Already? Okay. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Exhibit 697, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. And again, I'm going to ask you to read a small portion of this larger essay. Um, and I would ask you just the second paragraph. Can you read that? Yes. Should I confess that I have a large gas gash on my left wrist, a self-inflicted wound that had severed nerves and nearly cut through tendons? For me, one hand can only feel and move in a limp, numb way. Okay, what? I'm going to stop you. Did yes. he did he discuss this essay with you? Yes, did definitely. He, did he literally mean that his left hand couldn't move anymore? He could move it. He just said it felt different. Okay. And is he referring in this essay, did he tell you that he was writing about the time where he had cut his wrist. Yes. And he specifically, what did he specifically later tell you about cutting his wrist? He told me he had done it kind of in a, a, a painful response to my rejection. Um, later on in this essay, after he says limp, numb way, can we just go to um, one, one where it says hand, one of my hands, yeah. We have one of my hands has quit its status almost as lib as corpse proper. It is no longer proper. It is a shameful and an advertising of my own lack of well-being. The reversibility of hands is gone. For me, <laughs> one hand cannot feel. It is inactive, but it cannot be felt either. It is unpassive. I love you. What? Does it say I love you, Ted? Yes, but... Do you know what Ted refers there's to? There's no Ted, no. Okay. Um, um, and let me ask you, um, again, when he talks about his hand being unfeeling, is he referring to this physically or psychologically at this point, in, in terms of if he discussed it with you? When he discussed it with me, he said it felt different, but he was discussing how psychologically it felt numb and strange to him. Did Alex have some pet names or references he would call you besides boy? Yes. Um, what were those? His pet names for me mostly were his lamb. He would call me his son, as in S-U-N. And lamb, son, 
and his goon at times. All right, let me talk to you specifically about lamb. Yes. What did he tell you he meant by his lamb? As we were intimate, he would tell me, and as he would call me his lamb, he would use it in the holy sacrificial way as the lamb of Christ or the lamb of God. He would tell me I was his holy sacrifice. I was his lamb. Did that have a specific reference, his lamb, in relationship to what's shown on the cover of the Kierkegaard book? Did he say that to you? Yes, we discussed this deeply. Um, the sacrifice that, or what is shown on the book is the story of Abraham and his struggle as he was called to sacrifice his son, which he had an ultimate love for. And he would discuss to me the beauty and everything that was in the lines and in between the lines for him for that novel, as he would read it to me during intercourse. And was there a specific comparison between the lamb that yes. Abraham substitutes for his son and calling you the lamb? Yes. Can you explain what that is? As he would say to me that Abraham, the sacrifice of the son is a sacrifice to God, the holiness of it. And he considered me his lamb, his holy sacrifice, and all of the love in that, and the sacrifice of not wanting to give that up. He also used the word son, S-U-N. Was yes. he referring to anything specific when he told you he was, you were his son? Yes, he had a pet name for... And, I know and this is embarrassing. So. It, it, this is embarrassing for me. Um, it's in reference to my v vagina. It, the sun, the blaze, the warmth. He would often talk about how my intimate area was his son. S-U-N. That was not embarrassing for her. She's extremely proud of that fact. Hence the smile and her looking directly at the jury when she tells them this. Now, during this time, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to take you up now to, um, first of all, are there many journal phrases where Alex would refer to love and do what you will? Yes. Did you take the journals and count up what you thought, how many times that he would actually refer to that phrase in his journals? Yes. How many times did you count? Roughly, it was the high 20s into the 30s. It's, it's deeply woven into the journals. Was that phrase also deeply woven into your relationship? Yes. It seemed like instead of your typical morning text message, it would be a text of love and do as you will. Or he would somehow bring it into almost every conversation we would have intimately just normal conversation at the coffee shop at home it was it was always a part of every day i'm going to ask you um about some specific sexual acts between you and alex all right all right as your sexual relationship progressed into January and February, yes, did the sexual acts between you and Alex undergo a change from what they had been? Yes. Can you please tell us what that was? Well, from what I said before, the more vanilla, it turned into a what at times could be considered a BDSM relationship. What does BDSM mean? BDSM is bind, dominance, and it can be submissive or sadomasochist. It's, it depends on what sector you're in, if it's submissive, dominant, or sadomasochism. Okay, I'm going to ask you this with respect to Alex, okay? Yes. Have you heard, in respect to BDSM, what a safe word is? Yes. What is a safe word? In a BDSM relationship, 
A safe word is essentially, it's one of the most important parts of the relationship I consider. It's when in an act, when something is getting too much for you or one of the partners or the submissive. And a safe word is something that individual can say when it's just too much and it's time to stop. In sexuality, first of all, with regard to Alex, what role did you play, the dominant or the submissive? I took the role of submissive. And in that role, did Alex and you have a safe word? I suggested it, but we did not agree and we did not have a safe word, no. Why didn't you agree? What did Alex tell you with respect to ha not having a safe word? He didn't prefer a safe word. He he told me in our relationship that it didn't, he didn't want that essentially. It didn't play into kind of what he wanted to get out of the relationship. We don't have proof of Alex saying this, and it should be noted that in all the correspondence between Ezra and Alex, he was extremely caring towards her and respectful of her boundaries. I say that to state that while we don't know if this is true or not, we do know that acting this way does not fall within what we know of Alex's character, but lying about something like this does fall within Ezra's. And I'm going to ask you about some specific sexual acts. First of all, I'm going to ask you about wax or what's called wax play. Wax play is when you use a candle, like a candle or a wax like substance, and you drip or drain it onto your partner, the submissive. Before you referred to prone, and we only discussed prone in terms of you being face down, was there another aspect to what was called prone that eventually developed in your sexual relationship with Alex? What eventually developed with this prone position is the desire for the submissive in this role to be in a what is commonly called a chokehold or to to appear to be unconscious. Did, was that something he did with you? Yes. Um, let me ask you, how is it that without a safe word, in your mind, did this connect at all with what Alex used to say to you about your flaws and vulnerability? Yes. Can you please explain that to us? With Without a... In an act like this, or in an asexual act, without a safe word, it, it is hard for me as an individual to be vulnerable. I was uncomfortable with the idea of no safe word, and he demanded from me to be vulnerable in these times, and that was hard for me. In addition to the wax and the chokehold thing you described, was there ever a time back in your relationship in January or February where Alex used a knife when having sex with you? Yes, he had cut a pair of my pants that I had one day. It never went as far to touch or graze my skin. He just ripped through some holes that were already on my pants and I just, I threw them away after that. What was your reaction to these things? The wax, the chokehold, the knife, that one occasion. Um, what was your reaction to these? My reaction, I was very supportive of his dominance at first. I wanted him to feel like he can express himself. And I was also exploring. With the wax, it, it was different and it was a bit strange for me at first, but that it was fine. I found I had issues with the prone position and being in a chokehold from behind. I started to not enjoy that. It was really just not what I wanted, and I had voiced my opinion a few times. It was just, it wasn't with my alignment. The time he had cut my pants, he ripped through some holes already and he cut them and I was a bit frustrated at the sense that oh great I have to throw some pants away now but it made me a bit uncomfortable because it was so sudden and so new. Well, let me just take you back to something you said because I want to follow up. You said you voiced your opinion? Yes. What did you say to him when you voiced your opinion? 
When I voiced my opinion to him, I said to him, essentially, in this prone position or in this position, that I was sore, that at times it was uncomfortable and it felt as if it was a bit bruising and constricting for me. It caused anxiety. When you told him that you didn't like it, yes. how did he respond to you? Well, it was quite crude how he responded, but he would tell me that it wasn't fair that I had finished and he wasn't going to get his chance then. So you're telling him you don't like this to not do it. He's saying it's unfair I didn't get to finish. What would happen as a, you know, either during, after, before those conversations? During the conversation, he would express how he was, he thought it was unfair he didn't get to finish because he spent so much time for me. And I, I would just essentially not completely shut down, but just say, all right, and just let, let it go, just let it happen. So you would let him complete what he yes, wanted to do? Yes, yes. Even when you didn't feel like it? Yes. I'm showing you from Exhibit 697 an essay called Between Love and Obligation. Yes. What's the date on that? December 3rd, 2017. Is the type version the same as the handwritten? Yes. This essay, does it begin with him talking about love and do as you will? Yes. And as this essay continues, does he talk about love and do as you will? I'm not going to have you read it, but is there a continued discussion about what it means? Yes. Does he specifically um, mention there is love and do as you will. Don't worry about self-control. Be excessive if you want to. There is nothing you ought to do. Anything goes. Yes. Did he discuss that with you? Yes. What did he mean by that? What he meant by that, because there's the original love and do as you will, but... When he says it, it was his way of it saying, this is what I mean when I say this to you. This is what I mean when I say love and do as you will. So in other words, in your intimate relationship with Alex, would he express a divergence from the philosophical love as you do with will to the personal love and do as you will? Yes. Sustained leading. Okay, what did he express about how love and do as you will meant to him personally in your relationship? What he told me in our relationship is that there is going to be times when he's going to take control he's going if he there's going to be times when he's demanding certain things and love and do as you will as he would say is the reason why he's able to do this because he will do as he will it it was his way of saying I'm going to do this and love and do as you will he would say I'm showing you the sentence that's near the very end of this essay on the page that begins with the, mer the word merely. Yes. Can you please read that sentence? Merely doing as one will sexually makes consent irrelevant, but merely letting another do as they will does the same. All right. Again, unless Alex is lying in his journals to himself, which would make zero sense, that is not what he is saying to Ezra. His philosophies had nothing to do with assaulting people he loved because if they loved him, they would let him do whatever he wanted to them, which he didn't fully believe Ezra loved him, so his philosophies wouldn't be applicable anyway. But we've already gone over what his use of love and do as you will meant based on his writings. They cut off the context about his statement on consent, making it seem as if he is arguing that consent is irrelevant. But if you read the surrounding passage, that's not at all what he's saying. At this point, I genuinely feel like I'm Mugatu or something and I'm, I'm taking crazy pills. What's incredibly disgusting is, as Ezra is stating that this term was used as a reason that they didn't have a safe word, and as proof that Alex didn't care about consent, the passage on the board reads out, Do as you will, I'll accept, almost, anything because I believe you won't do badly. You love, so I ought not abuse. I love, do as you will, don't kill me. His writings indicate that the statement about complete trust 
and how you are giving the person you love the ability to hurt you more than anyone else. There's something extremely sinister about the fact that Ezra believes that she can lie on the stand the way that she is. It's as if she doesn't think anyone in the jury is able to read, or can interpret language the way that she can. This issue about consent being irrelevant by doing as he would. Yes. Were you aware of this sentence in his journals before the sexual acts became, in January and February, things you were uncomfortable with? Yes, it was a conversation we had in detail. And how did you feel about this line about consent being irrelevant? Well, as I was reading this essay and we're discussing, yet again, love and do as you will, I pointed it out and I told him that I felt completely the opposite of this. I come from a point of when consent is everything, like consent, 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 each step of the way. And this, for me, was a first red flag. I'm showing you a very short essay. Yes. Called Resolution, written on January 1st, 2108. Yes, I'm familiar. Okay. And is the typed version the same as the handwritten version? Yes. All right. Can you read that essay? I need to be. I need to be more selfish. My relationships have failed because I couldn't ask for what I wanted or needed. I love people who are hurting, but I am too. To find anything that will last, I need to find a way to be selfish. Oddly, I need to find resol resoluteness? <laughs> resoluteness in this resolution. Selfishness needs to find a place in my values. So as he started to take and do what he wanted sexually, Yes. And you were protesting. Yes. Did you think about this essay where he had said this at all? Yes, I had. I, I thought about it often. And I'm going to show you one last essay now. And um, I think we're going to be done with the essays. Okay. At that point. Now, I'm showing you, again, another essay. What's the title of this essay? The title of this essay is Faith in Flesh, February 2nd, 2018. And again, is the typed version the same as the handwritten version? Yes. And I'm going to ask you about a specific paragraph that's kind of in the middle of this essay. Can you read this paragraph? Yes. Next, the other may demand that I not die. They may demand that I not commit self-sacrifice. This may be because they enjoy my self-mutilation or, be beca or because they refuse to carry the guilty of my guilty flesh. In both cases, my duty is to feed is complicated. For to give purely is suicide. For to give purely is suicide, go ahead. Violence against another to provide for this demanding okay, other. I'm sorry, I think Did I miss a sentence? Line? One minute. For to give purely to suicide can involve, <laughs> can involve a cessation of violence, but it is the obligation to not die oddly, I must commit violence against another to provide for this demanding other. This forces me to murder. In order to provide, I am doing it either way. This is demanding, this demanding other has taken my redeeming suicide from me and doomed me to torturous guilty. Okay. So when you saw that Alex had written about murder in his journal, did this stand out to you in any way? Yes, this essay did stand out to me. Okay, I'll ask you more about that later. I'm going to go back to talking to you about um, Jason. All right. All right.
Yes. Um, this relationship's developing with Alex. Yes. And as this is going on, what's going on with you and Jason? As our relationship with Alex and I developed, the rift between me and Jason and the distance furthered. We, it seemed as if we were more roommates and just living together than we were girlfriend and boyfriend anymore. It's because you were cheating on him. That's what happens when you cheat on someone and tell everyone in your life that that person mistreats you and you begin spending most of your time with your other boyfriend. What were you thinking about doing with respect to your relationship with Jason? I was thinking about leaving, ending it, breaking up. Now, you heard Jenna Van Zandt testify before? Yes. And I believe that I'm showing you what's been marked previously as exhibit number 405 and entered in evidence. Is this a copy of texts that went between you and Jenna Van Zandt? Yes. Um, and what did you say to Jenna Van Zandt in that text? Would you like me to read it exactly? Um, or you can summarize it or read it either way. In summary, I was expressing that I needed more boundaries, that I was feeling mistreated and I, the relationship was unhealthy. There was no communication, miscommunications, and that I, I, I need to talk to him about these things and I might need to leave. Well, in the beginning, you say, I'm realizing I'm finally brave enough to talk to Jason. Yes. To talk. Did you also refer in this to breaking up with him? Yes. Yes. And did you talk about how other people were telling you about your relationship with Jason? Yes, a lot of my friendships I had at Racy's, I would tell them examples and things that were going on between me and Jason. And my friends at the time, they were telling me that this is unhealthy and damaging and you need to get out of this. Um, did you talk about him specifically name calling you? Yes, he had called me names. In this, I said specifically, he called me retard, retarded, one of the most offensive things to me. Okay. Now, on this day, on February 5th, was this right before you, in fact, did break up with Jason? I believe so, yes. I'm just going to briefly diverge All right. into something else. Um, well, let me just say this. Eventually, did you also break up with Alex? Yes. Did you break up with the two of them in the same month? Yes. So which breakup was first? Jason. And how long after breaking up with Jason, did approximately how long, I know you don't have a calendar, did you break up with Alex? Not long after, a few weeks or so, maybe a month. During this time, did you, did you also spend some time with a fellow named John Hansen? Yes, I had. How did you know him? He was my friend through Jason. And being your friend through Jason, did you have any interest in John Hansen? Yes, at the time I did have some interest in John Hansen. Would the word crush express that, or what word would you use? I had developed a crush, yes. When Jason went out of town, well, so you were spending some time with John Hansen. Um, did you know of a friendship between John Hansen and Alex as well? I was well aware of their friendship, yes. And Phyllis, did they discuss philosophies as far as you knew? Yes, they discussed philosophy all of the time. Um, do you know if specifically they discussed a philosophy called nihilism? Yes. Section relevance. Overruled. Go ahead. Did they? Okay, go ahead. Yes, that was a topic all three of us had discussed together all the time. And when discussing nihilism, what did Alex Woodworth say that it meant to him? What Alex Woodworth expressed to me about nihilism is that it's a kind of take all. It's a going against the 
norms of society and it's a very in a lot of ways it's kind of a pe pessimistic nihilism it's a very different view of life than i had at the time what about john did he express similar things to you objection yeah. relevance i'm going to sustain that uh, it, again it's what's in miss mccandless it's in her mind uh so sustain on that now when Jason went out of town, um, John Hansen and you, had you done some drawings, paintings, or anything like that? Yes, we had been hanging out quite a bit, doing art together. When Jason went out of town, did something happen with you and John Hansen? Yes. What happened? What happened between me and John is that he bought some wine for us, and I had gone over to his house to talk about what's going on between me and Jason, and... Alex and what's really going on and I hadn't really eaten anything that day and I started to drink a lot of wine and I had ultimately become severely drunk to the point of throwing up and blacking out a few times. Did you, so is it fair for me to say when you say blacking out a few times, do you mean that you were in and out of consciousness? Yes. Does it also mean that you have a hard time recovering some of what happened that evening? Yes. Is there something specific sexually, though, that you do recall about that evening? Yes. What is that? Specifically, I remember it being dark and w w waking up, and I could clearly feel that I was in a sexual act that I... Some Someone was having sex with me. Did you know who that person was? Yes, it was John. The next day, did John... Um, so let me ask you this. This sexual act, did you resist him at all? No, I just let it happen. The next day, uh, in the morning, what happened? In the morning, he told me to go to his son's room and wait until he got up so that his roommate wouldn't suspect that I was in his bed. And did you eventually go back home? Yes, we, he drove me back to my apartment. When he drove you back to your apartment, did he come in? Yes, he did. And um, what happened once you were inside the apartment? Once we were inside the apartment, he had said that he had to go to the bathroom. So I went upstairs to change out of my clothes from the night before, and he came into my room with me, and... This is hard. Um, he just started undoing his belt and said that I looked great and uh, proceeded to ask me and lead me to perform sexual acts with him. As a reminder, the investigation into this offense was dropped after multiple of Ezra's friends were interviewed by detectives about this assault and they stated that Ezra had told them that the sex had been consensual. Moreover, she deleted the text between her and John in which she stated that she couldn't wait to see him again to have sex and inquired when they could hang out next, probably to have sex. She told the detective that the texts were too triggering for her to look at and that they were deleted. However, John Hansen provided the texts to the police without question. And again, did you resist him at all? No. Did you tell him, no, I don't want to do this? I didn't say much of anything, so no, I did not. Now, after that incident with John Hansen, was it shortly after that that you left Jason's apartment and broke up with Jason? Yes. Where did you move when you left his apartment? I moved to my mother's. Who helped you move? <coughs> Alex helped me move. Had you previously introduced Alex to your family, or at least to your mother? A few times he met my family, yes, at Racy's. And had Alex also uh, come over to the office that your mom worked in one time? Yes, I invited him to come help peel some wallpaper from the office. When Alex came over to your families, did even after helping you move back home, was he invited back another occasion? Yes. And who did he spend time with on that occasion? On that occasion, he spent time with me and my mother. Anybody else? Yes. Who? My sister and my dad, my stepdad. And what's your stepdad's name? James Gunnelson. Okay. Um, 
after you moved out, were you still seeing Jason at all? Well, first of all, when you moved out, was Jason in town or out of town? He was out of town. And um, were you still seeing him at all? Was he still your boyfriend? He wasn't my boyfriend, no, but we were still texting. Things were confusing between us. They were confusing because she hadn't actually broken up with him. They were also confusing because she was still sleeping with Alex, one of Jason's closest friends. During this period, how did Jason come to know about John Hanson? Or did he come to know, is I guess what I should say. He did, yes. How, do you know how he came to know about it? I do know. He had wanted to spend some time with me in Eau Claire, so he rented a hotel room for us. And after a night together, I woke up to him going through my phone. And there had been some text messages. What, just, I just want to back up there a second. When you say your phone, was it actually a phone or a different device? No, I never use a real phone. I always use an iPod, which I've been using for a while when I'm connected to Wi-Fi. So I'm pretty disconnected otherwise. No, it's not. This point is a bit nitpicky, and I apologize for that, but she is attempting to portray herself as being different from the majority of the population. She isn't like the other teens and young people today. She doesn't have a phone. However, when her iPod is connected to Wi-Fi, she can make calls, send texts, and it operates exactly like a smartphone. She used Instagram constantly, with her still using it while she's in prison. Her pretending as if she wasn't like other people her age and that she was so disconnected from social media and media as a whole is blatantly false. She was incredibly connected. She was around people all the time. And she didn't live her stupid life in this inspirational, media-free way. Why would you even lie about this? Other than to obviously try and make yourself seem cool and smart compared to other people your age. She's just lying about all this stuff. Okay. And... Um, in fact, there was a phone found in your car on yes. March, after March 22nd when the police found that. Was that phone functional? Um, I don't know because I never paid the bill. I got it for just a little while for work, and then I just stopped using it altogether. So it ran out of minutes, of course, so no, it was not functional. Okay. Let me get back to this whole issue about Jason going through your iPod. Um, what did... What happened when he went through your iPod? When he had gone through my iPod, there was a few text messages that were flirtatious between me and John that I had not deleted. They were not flirtatious. She was asking him when he was going to sleep with her next, and saying she wanted to hang out with him soon because he was more than just a good dick. But, her small addition, that she had not deleted the messages implies, these kind of messages were not uncommon for her but she had developed the habit of deleting them after the conversation finished. Jason woke me up, and he had screenshotted my text messages. He was pretty angry, and he even broke my iPod in this anger. And when he broke your iPod during this anger, did he do anything else to you? Yes, during this conversation we were having an argument. He threw my iPod to the floor after reading these text messages to me. He pushed me down on the bed and told me I couldn't leave until this was resolved. What Did Jason place a phone call to anyone? Yes, he had called John. During this conversation, were you able to hear the entire conversation? I was right with him the entire time. Were you asked to talk to John during this conversation? Yes. Who asked you to do that? Jason asked me to speak with John. And did uh, Jason say something to John about having sex with you? Yes, he asked him if I, he had had sex with me, and John responded that he had not. Um, and why did, do you know why Jason made you talk to John on the phone? He made me speak with John on the phone that he, so he could lit so that he could listen to our conversation and see if he would change his story. And during that conversation, <coughs> did John acknowledge that he had had sex with you? Yes. And had you acknowledged that to Jason? Yes. When you talked to Jason about this, yes. John having sex with you, um, yes. did you express at all that you thought it was a rape, or did you ever use that word? No. <coughs> did you ever use the word? 
I'm going to just give you want me to have some water? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's... Okay, why don't we just hang on just a second? Yeah. Of course. <coughs> Okay. okay, go ahead. Did you use the word assault when you talked to Jason? It was not a word I had used. No. Um, after you, he had talked to John on the phone, did he take you over to Josh Trankler's? Yes, he did take me to Josh Trankler's after this. Okay, who's Josh Trankler? He's a friend of ours, a friend we share. Yes. Um, what happened? I just want to make sure everybody's... What happened when Jason took you over to Josh Trankler's? Well, after I had told him roughly what had happened the night between me and John, Jason got just full of rage. He was pacing, and he told me he was going to do something to John, that he was going to kill John, that we needed to go somewhere to talk to somebody with a level head. So he, ta he had taken me to Josh's house. Though Ezra is adamant that she didn't directly state that John had raped her, that's clearly what the story indicated. And despite what she is claiming now on the stand, Jason and her were still in a relationship. Imagine the person you love, the person you believe you were going to marry, tells you that when they were at your trusted friend's house, that friend had sex with them after they had passed out. You would feel incredibly betrayed, angry, and confused. Jason's anger about the situation isn't uncommon, and though it's not ideal, he had just figured out either two of the people closest to him had betrayed him in the most intimate way possible, or one of his friends had betrayed him in the most intimate way possible, and his girlfriend didn't feel safe enough with him to tell him the truth, but recounts this event as if his reaction was ridiculous. She shakes her head, she rolls her eyes, and is acting like the whole situation was a massive overreaction on Jason's part. When he got to Josh's, was Jason <coughs> acting like he had a level head? No. <laughs> what was he doing? Jason went upstairs with Josh and he would pace downstairs and he was just pacing all over the house. He was yelling with, at Josh essentially and he just, he, he, he was very hot headed at that time. He was very angry. When you were downstairs, could you hear him upstairs? Yes. And as a result of all of this screaming and yelling that Yes. Jason was doing, to your knowledge, did Josh, to, how did you know that, or did you know how Josh Trankler responded? Yes, I do. He called the police because he was concerned as what Jason might do to John. When the police got there, did they ask to speak to you? Yes, they did. What did you tell them? The police were directed to me by Jason and Josh to talk to them and I didn't really want to talk in this place where everybody was angry and hot-headed so they asked me if I would like to go back to the station to talk and I said yes. Now you've been in court and you heard the tape of you talking to Officer Vang. Yes. Was everything you said on that tape true? Yes. You also heard testimony about you talking to Detective Proc. Yes. And Essentially, in so many words, did you tell Detective Proc essentially the same things that you told Officer Vang about the sex with you and John? Yes. Did you ever use the word assault or rape when you were talking with Detective Vang or Detective Proc? No. Did somebody bring up the word assault or, or something similar to you? Yes. Who was that who brought that up and defined what you told them or informed you that this is an assault? Objection relevance. Sustained. I would like to approach. All right. Objection is sustained. Actually, Judge, I withdraw the question. Okay. After hearing from Mr. DeFer. So, um, um, did you inform Detective Proc when you were meeting with him that you had been flirting with John? Yes, I told him about that. Okay. And did uh, Detective Proc and Officer Fang give you some literature after you met with them? Yes. Well, after I met with Vang, there were some individuals that they provided me with a folder full of pamphlets to, to get help and counsel during a tough time like this. Did you go to counseling? Yes, I did. All right. 
Now, I'm going to move from talking about that to talking about um, the period of this happening. First of all, before this happened, where Jason was looking at your iPod, yes. did you break off with Alex before that occurred? Yes. Uh, was Do you remember time-wise how recent it was before Jason looked at your iPod? It was briefly before, before approximately. Like a day or two, is that what you mean? Yeah, briefly? yes. Okay. And um, so I'm going to ask you some questions now about that period between All right. um, you moving back home, breaking off with Jason, then breaking off with Alex. First of all, yes. why did you break off with Alex? Let me ask you that first. I broke off with Alex because during this time there was so much going on and he wanted my love and vulnerability and it at that time I wasn't ready for a relationship. I felt there was just so much going on. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to work on my previous relationship yet. I wasn't ready. Ezra wasn't sure she was ready to be in a relationship. Meanwhile, she was in two. That's hysterical. When she opines, there was simply so much going on during the time where she broke up with both Alex and Jason, she says it as if it has nothing to do with her. As a reminder, the only thing going on were her affairs with Alex and John, and the fallout over her false accusation. And during this period, were you saying, what were you doing generally with your life? Who are you, you said you were living with your mother, I believe, yes. right? And living with your mother, were you working? Or what, yes, what was I was. going on with your life? So I moved back home with my mom, and I applied to a school that I graduated from. And I started soon after working as a paraprofessional in the kindergarten through fourth grade special education room. And besides working, were you talking much with your, uh, Jason during that time? Yes, I was. What were your feelings or your thoughts about Jason during this time in March? During this time, I lots of feelings of love from the love we had when we first started a relationship, memories from when we first started. Just being away from him made me miss him, and I was feeling again a lot of that love. As a reminder, she accused the person she is stating she loved of verbal abuse, being incredibly controlling, and attempting to turn his friends against him for months prior to their breakup. She had been cheating on him since the beginning of their entire relationship, and had gaslit him into thinking that telling her he was uncomfortable with her close intimate friendships with men was sexist. But the moment they break up and he tells her he doesn't want to see her anymore, she attempts to get the relationship back on track. She begins showing up to places she knows he will be. She repeatedly messages him and tries to hand deliver her journals to him. Journals which state that Alex and John had taken advantage of her and turned her against him. Were you texting about that? All of the time, yes. Was Jason reciprocating your texts? Yes. Did there, uh, in the middle of March, did you go to Eau Claire and spend any time with Jason? Yes. Just tell us about that briefly. I went and I spent some time with Jason. We had started sleeping with each other again and talking about possibly maybe getting counseling, thinking about all the things we had said to each other in the past, just seeing if maybe this really needed to work out because of how much we did love each other. And when you said you started sleeping with him, um, yes. where did you spend some time, a couple of nights with him or anything in Eau Claire? Yes, I spent a couple of nights with him. We got a few hotel rooms. We didn't really want to be at the apartment. Okay. After spending a couple of nights with Jason, do, do you recall th th what time that was? Was it like the date? Do you have any memory of what the exact dates were? I have no memory of the exact dates, no. Okay. Um, did you, um, return after spending a couple of nights to Jason's to your mother's house? I did, yes. And what happened when you got back to your mom's? Well, um, m my mom wasn't supportive of me continuing or exploring the idea of rekindling the relationship I had with Jason. And... Me being, her me being her child and 
she was my mom. We got into an argument. Of course, I I knew what I wanted, and I was she disagreed. So I moved out after that. This is also untrue. Her mother kicked her out. I don't know how to properly convey how much she is lying at this point. And if I paused the video every time, we would probably be here for years. There's also just no reason to lie about this. Okay. Um, let me ask you then about going. Um, so did your mom feel the same way about Alex that she felt about Jason in terms of what she expressed to you? She had some mixed feelings about Alex as well. And when you broke up with Alex, um, how did you break up with him? I regretfully broke up with him through text. Why did you do it through text? It was, I did it through text because I did it in a rushed way. I just wanted to just be done with all of this drama. Okay. We'll come back to talking about you and Alex later, but I'm going to ask you, after your mother was upset with you because yes. you were saying Jason and asked you to leave, where did you go? I went to my dad's. Um, and is that your father, Joe Shane Carlin, who we saw in court? Yes. All right. What is your father's main employment? He's a correctional officer. And besides his correctional officer primary, yes. does he have a do-it-yourself or a secondary business that he owns? He has a tree-cutting business that I helped name when I was about five. Did you uh, work with him at that tree-cutting business? All of the time, yes. And when you worked with him, um, did you use knives at all? It was a part of every day. When he, um, in addition to knives and the tree cutting service, did your father, I'm going to call him your father, he's your adoptive father. Yes, he's my father, he's okay. my dad. Um, did he give you or let you have other knives in your car? Yes, he seemed to always give me one or want me to have one in different places. There's been discussion here about the knife that um, that you used or the knife that was in your car that the police yes. found by the side of the road, the knife that was involved in the knife fight with you and Alex. And yes. Was that, and how did you get that knife? Objection, Your Honor, to Mr. Stain, argumentative. Okay, the knife we're talking about, how yes. did you get that knife? That knife was a knife that my dad had given me. He's, he always likes to make sure I'm prepared for every situation. So various EMT knives he would give to me to break glass. It has seatbelt cutters. He just wants me to be prepared. It had been in and out of the house. He has a few of them, yes. And that particular knife, did you put it in your car on the morning of March 22nd? No. Do you know when you put it in your car? No, it was in and out always. Okay. Um, what would your dad, specifically with the use of knives, what would your father tell you about that? Objection. Hearsay. Sustain. A judge, it goes to her say to mine, not the truth of the matter asserted. Let, let me rephrase right. the question. Maybe okay. it'll be more clear. Did your father ever say anything to you about having a knife in your car specifically um, for defending yourself? Objection. Hearsay. Well, it's not offered for the truth. No. The matter is sort of just for what is in her state of mind, so Correct. I'll overrule the objection. Okay. What? Yes. Okay. What did he tell you, or what do you recall him telling you? What I recall my dad telling me, he told me many times, and he would always tell me, when you're in a situation with an individual or if someone's attacking you, that you need to do anything and everything you can to get away, to defend yourself. And he would tell me about... You can use knives, you can scratch, you can kick, you can fight. Were you aware that there were firearms in his house? Well aware. Did you know where they were located? Always, yes. He made me aware of this. Uh, were you able to have access to them? Yes. Did you learn how to use firearms when you were young? Of course. He made sure of that. Did you go hunting with your father? I never hunted, but I've gone hunting many times. Now, did you take a firearm with you when you left your father's house on the morning of March 22nd? Absolutely not. Why not? All I was doing that day was going for some errands. There was no need for a weapon or a firearm or anything of that sense. 
Was one of those errands that you were going to do on March 22nd, in your mind, was one of the things you wanted to do to talk to Alex? Yes. And um, so did you want to bring a gun with you to talk to Alex? Absolutely not. Were you afraid of Alex? No. All right. I'm going to ask you some specific uh, uh, communication that you had received on the evening of March 21st. Uh, were you sent a picture on Instagram by Jason? Yes, I was. Um, and that's a picture we've seen that's an evidence of the bathroom wall? Yes, it after, is. After you received that picture, uh, what did you do? Well, I wasn't happy about it. Did you have then a voice conversation with Jason yes, I in did addition call him. to texting? Yep. And when you saw that picture, did you have some thoughts in your mind about who had written your phone number and, um, you know, F me on the yes. bathroom wall? I had some ideas. I thought it was either a barista or maybe some of the kitchen boys, as they're called. What, what do you mean by kitchen boys? Kitchen boys, well, that's what they call the workers who work in the kitchen side of Racy Dell Lanes, which is called the nucleus. Just a bunch of guys. Like cooks, chefs? Cooks, chefs. Did you, in your mind, did you think Alex had written it? No. Um, it your was, Honor, then I'm going to object to this whole line of questioning as not being relevant. Well, the, the state brought this in for some reason. I think her state of mind about yeah, it. I'm going to overwrite. Thank you. Um, were you planning to mention it to Alex? Yes, I was. What was your intent with telling Alex about this? My intent with telling Alex about this was just to ask him, like, how do you think they got my number? It kind of sucks that this is going on. There's a lot of drama. Do you know who might be doing it? So I could ask them that this isn't right. Can you stop, please? All right. Before, in, in the period of time where... You were at home. Yes. In March. Were you writing any journals? Yes, I was. I'm showing you what's been marked as exhibit number 365. Yes. And what's the title of that journal? This journal is Ezra McCandless, Silence Broken. I'm also showing you what's been marked as 366. Is there a title on that journal? There's no title, but it's called Journal 2. were you writing these two journals? It was a period of a couple weeks. I had been visiting someone for counseling, and they told me maybe to write Objection, down... Objection, hearsay, sustain. Why were you writing the journals? To express how I felt oh, about it's... everything. And were you doing it specifically because you were trying to have this be part of the therapeutic process for you? Yes. All right. So there's been some testimony about these journals being edited on March 21st. Yes. Did you open the journals on March 21st? Yes. Over the period of weeks, I had finished it a couple weeks before, but as a writer, you always open it to correct misspellings, alignment of paragraphs. Every time I open it, it adds that it's been seen or edited. Was this journal in a format called Google Docs? Yes. And in Google Docs, every time you open a document, does it update the date? <coughs> it does, yes. Okay. Um, did you, uh, you've reviewed these journals, right? Of course, yes. And y were you going to send them to a friend named Julia Post? Yes, I had sent them to her already. And what was the purpose of doing that? The reason why I spent time with a few weeks before and why I had sent them to her is she's she's great with grammar and she's great with words so she was helping me out she was kind of my consult for cleaning it up okay I'm gonna put this now on the Elmo we're not gonna read everything but I'm just gonna ask you in this journal what you're talking about and why just in summary form all right so just to summarize this part of the journal when you're talking about moving uh, back, it was the past summer and you had moved. Had you 
been, where had you been before the summer you moved back with your parents? The summer before I moved back with my parents was spent in Marinette, Wisconsin, and that's where I was starting my first year of secondary school. Okay, so after your first year of, so secondary school for you, does that mean, are you referring to college? Yes. Okay, just some people call secondary school high school, so I just that's wanted true. to clarify college. that. Okay, and so after your first year of college, um, are you telling us you had gone back home? Yes, I am. All right. Now, when you went back home, did you uh, did you then write in your journal about your relationship with uh, Jason Mangle? Yes, I did. Um, you used this sentence. Months have passed between us and love had grown. It's an ancient love so powerful it often scared both of us. I became sick and had the suspicion of what it could be. So what do you mean when you're writing in those passages? What I mean by, as I said in there, an ancient love so powerful. Many times between me and Jason, our own philosophical discussions, we talk about past loves, being old spirit. We, can, we both consider ourselves, even though I'm young, to be very, very old spirits. So, Is that that expression people use sometimes, oh, he or she's an old soul? Yeah, all the time, okay. all the time. He would describe me as his old soul. So as saying that this love this passion, this love, it was just, we felt so much love and so much in common with each other right away that that's just how I express that. As a reminder, these were some of the writings that she sent to John when he had specifically asked her to no longer contact him. These journals were used to convince Jason that she had been assaulted, and that even though she'd been sleeping with Alex for months, and had actively scolded Jason for assuming that the relationship was too close, and that she'd been victimized by both John and Alex. These journals are not like Alex's journals. Alex wrote his philosophical musings for essentially an audience of one. Other than Ezra, no one in his life was going through his notes, and he didn't send them to anyone, but Ezra's journals were meant to get Jason to trust her and believe her story. It's relevant that while in the relationship, she told others that Jason was slovenly and abusive, that he lacked any sort of intelligence and was often cruel to her. But when they broke up and he tried to establish boundaries with her, suddenly she believes he is her long-lost love from a beautiful winter's past, from a lifetime ago, where they would have their own intellectual discussions. In the essay, did you go on to talk about your abortion? Yes, I had. Um, and... Did you express how the abortion impacted your relationship with Jason Mango? I expressed how it impacted us greatly, yes. Okay. And did you then write in this journal about after, you said in this journal that you became, I think the word is, a husk of a woman. Yes. And what did you mean by that? What I meant by that is after the operation and after everything that had happened, I felt just so, I felt like a part of myself had been taken away. I felt hollow inside. You then start talking about two individuals invading your empty mind, yes. dragging you down a rabbit hole, told what ideas to follow, masks you should wear. Can you explain what you meant when you wrote about that? Yes. So during this incredible, vulnerable time when I had terminated my pregnancy. My, the two dominant voices I'm speaking of here are friends, were friends, Alex and John Hansen. I was talking about in this how during my vulnerable t state, I was being told kind of how to feel, how to get over things, what to do, just kind of how to I describe it as a mask, just kind of how to move past this in ways they thought might help or what I should do, they thought. So this is your feelings then, but as you were going through this, you, you talked about developing feelings of love for Alex. Yes. So in here you're expressing it completely differently. Yes. Why the difference? The difference is coming out of the relationship. I, I don't want you to look at this. I just okay. want you to talk about how you felt. All right. So coming out of the relationship, I in that relationship, I felt all of this love and this warmth and listening to him and him telling me what I should do and what I should think, essentially. In that moment, all I felt was that love. I was only, that's all I was, all I could notice. And then being completely removed from a relationship, 
And from that relationship, I noticed all of the red flags or things that really didn't fit right with me. And that it's opposite now because I'm expressing what I had, I had ignored because of love. Let me ask- so basically, she is stating directly that Alex and Hansen had maliciously sought to control her while she was recovering from her abortion, which to be clear is not true. The evidence indicates that Hansen just wanted to have sex with Ezra, and at no point was telling her what to think, feel, or do. I'm sure if she came to him and stated she was upset because of her abortion, he would have at least listened to her. But he wasn't trying to turn her away from Jason to make her his own. And the same was true for Alex. She just read pages and pages of journal entries from Alex, stating his love for her, how he didn't want to change her, how he felt wanting to change a person at all, was proof you never loved them in the first place. He didn't tell Ezra how to act. He literally did the opposite and told her no matter what she did, he would always love her. But now they are both abusive manipulators who sought to destroy her. There can never be relationships that didn't work out or issues that arose that made her feel bad but didn't mean the other party was a terrible person. Anytime there is any issue, it's always because the other person is villainous and out to get her. So far, she has called every person she has ever said was close to her abusive while on the stand. She also states directly here that Alex's suicide attempt happened because she told him that she didn't want to see him. According to the messages they exchanged as well as the testimony she just gave, that isn't true. He was suffering with depression, and while I am sure his relationship with Ezra didn't help, we have not been shown proof that he lorded his attempt over her in order to get her to sleep with him. Let me ask you this. Okay? Yes. Um... In this, it, yes. without coming on the screen, you you wrote, I was an object even called a fetish, Can and that it horrified you to be described as a fetish. Can you tell me what you mean by that? <laughs> what I meant by that in this essay, or journal as you can call it, was that the person I had loved at that time were, uh, in, instead of just being me and wanting to be seen as me, they started to express how... I was a fetish to them, how, how I identified, how I looked, what they wanted from me. Instead of essentially being, as a McCandless, the person, I was just the want, the fetish, the sexual aspects. Is that how you felt at that time in your relationship with Alex? Yes. And um, you talk about what happened with John and vomiting and yes. fears. Um, and then you also then talked to that you had turned to your other friend for advice and concerns. Yes. And what do you mean by that, you would turn to your other friend? What were you writing about? I had talked about in there turning to my other friend being Alex about what had happened between me and John. And you said that when you turned to Alex, um, you wrote, to, you said, guilt towards our friendship only to once again for it to turn to his desires of making me the boy he wanted. What did you mean by that? When what had happened between me and John had happened, I quickly, shortly after I went to go talk to Alex, I told him my fears about what had happened, the confusion, the kind of the betrayal aspect of it, and... During that time, when I went over to his house to see him, he just kind of told me, well, I can make you forget it. You can sleep with me. We can spend some time together. Let me make you forget. What you wrote in your journal after that was, quote, it was painful, and I often said stop. Yes. I can't, and then you wrote bit, but I think you mean but. But he would then yes. change... The position and proceed to say I'm fine and just too sensitive. Earlier you talked about your sex with Alex talking about you're fine. Yes. That he should finish. Is that what you're referring to in this journal? Yes and I was referring to yes the sensitive feeling bruised. I was referring to that yes. And at the end of the journal you have a section called what is next. Yes. If, what are you talking about in the what is next section? Do you need me to put it up on the screen for you to refresh your memory? Sure. Okay. Just put that section. 
motion. Okay, so just, again, I don't want you to read the whole thing, but... I'm refreshed, yes. Okay, so let me ask you this. When you're, when you're talking about this in this section, about what is next, what are you talking about in this journal? What I'm talking about in this journal, in, there were sections of this, in this journal going through my relationship, my loves I had had, and in this what is next is I was writing about, like... What am I going to do next? What can I become? I felt that my opportunities are endless. I can keep pursuing the career I want. Just i very inspired by a conversation I had with my father and how I can take a course of action for myself. I can become who I am. When you said I betrayed the one I love in many ways and felt nothing but regret and pain knowing how far I lost myself, you put that yes. in there. Yes, I had. And were you talking about how you were going to change that, or what were you talking about? When I was talking about that, not that I was going to change the betrayal and the feelings of guilt, is that just acknowledging that this had happened. I'm not going to hide from what I had done. And I acknowledge the fact that my partner at that time was deeply hurt, and I can recognize that and acknowledge it. You ended this with writing, I cannot hurt myself anymore, I cannot hurt the ones I love, yes. I can become Ezra McCandless again, I am worth it. What did you mean by that? What I meant by that is, there was so much going on in the past months. There was drama, there was loss, and there was pain, and there was love. And I've stepped back, and I recognize all of it. I recognize that... I am worth it as a person. I can be what I want to be. I can do what I want to do. As in career-wise, as an artist, I can just express myself and embrace that it's, it's, it's time for a change. Let me ask one thing in this journal, and I'm trying to find the line. Yes. Um, and I think Mr. <coughs> you, oh. Okay, the part about what is next, you talked about being inspired by your dad. Did you write the whole paragraph, what is next, or was that just a feeling you're having? I'm a little confused. The whole paragraph at the end, what is next? Did I, you, yes, I wrote it, yes. I, I know you wrote it, but did yes. you write that whole paragraph that night? or No, did you write no, it, it was, it kind of corroborated the fact that I can do this. I am worth it. He helps me embrace that feeling more with our talks. Okay. And you also, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but you yes. also wrote what's called Journal 2. Yes. What's Journal 2, uh, what are you writing about in Journal 2? In Journal 2, it was mostly, it was more of a reflection of the guilt, the pain, the relationship issues I had had. It was also... It was another. It was kind of disconnecting myself from another in a relationship and looking at that, reflecting on that, and how I felt about that at that time. And is that journal too much more specific to your relationship with Alex Woodward? Yes. Okay. And um, again, um, you end that with saying, "I do not discount my part." In the abuse, I do not feel innocent. Are you referring also with Jason when you say I do not feel innocent? Who are you referring to? I'm referring to all of it, all of it, to Jason, to all of my relationships at the time. Okay. My mother, my father. Are you feeling d d that you're taking responsibility or? Yes, very much so. Is, is that a theme in therapy? Was your, you yes. know, that? Yes. Objection. Sustained. Um, were you wanting during this period of time to take responsibility for your own actions? Very much so. I I didn't I wasn't running from anything I've ever done. I wasn't I was taking responsibility for my actions and even if I didn't want to look at all of the ugly parts, I was going to do it because I have a responsibility to grow as a person. And that's a big step of that. You ended that essay with, I know I can be human, I know I can be free, I know I can love, I know I can only strive to never do this again. What did you mean by that? What I meant by that is 
to be more aware, to be more conscious of my relationships. What I meant by that is I can be human. I can express myself. I am not hiding and I'm not... Essentially, that was mostly about cheating and leaving someone for certain reasons. Now, after you, um, did you send those journals to Jason Mengel? Yes. Um, did you want to show your journals to Alex and John? Yes. Objection, hearsay, or I'm sorry, meeting. I'm sorry, what? Like was there, reading. okay, besides, okay. Sustained. let me just rephrase the question. Okay. Besides giving the journals to uh, Jason and Julia Post, did you want to go show these journals to anybody in person? Yes, I wanted to discuss these in person and talk about it and show them them, yes. Who did you want to show these journals in person to? Alex and John, they're integral parts of the journals, so I thought they should be shown. And Why? If these two men had abused her and made her feel like a fetish instead of a person and had manipulated her into ruining her life, as she stated, why in the world would she want to casually show them her essays accusing them? People react to abuse in different ways, but genuinely, the concept that she would want to meet up with these men who had hurt her in such a profound way that she contemplated suicide just to tell them that they did that is one of the most unbelievable things she has ever said. Also, it's just an objectively cruel thing to do. Ezra knew Alex had struggled with his mental health, and in his writings, he viewed her as a nearly perfect person. He shared his writings with her, and though she maliciously misquoted them in court, it was clear that he held her opinion of him above all else. He spoke so highly of her that he often stated he had no idea why she was interested in him, and how he had gotten so lucky. He had been deeply hurt by their breakup, but understood why it happened. If she were to tell him now that she saw their months-long affair as him taking advantage of her, not accepting her flaws and all, and that she viewed him as an abuser, he would have been entirely heartbroken. Um, of those two people, yes, who was more important for you to do that with? Alex. Did you bring physical copies, or were you just going to look it out on your phone, or what were you going to do? I didn't bring any physical copies. I have it always loaded up on my notes and in my Google, so there's really, if I want to read it to him or if I want to look at it, I can just pull it up. So on the morning of March 22nd, did you come into town? Yes, I did. And when you came into town? Yes. Um, I'm going to ask you about coming into town that day, all right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been previously admitted to evidence as Exhibit 424. Can you see this from where you are? Yes, I can see this. Okay. Um, this is uh, called the Timeline of Events of March 22nd. Do you remember yes. this? Yes, I do remember All right. this. So when you first came into town, where did you go um, first when you drove into town? First when I drove into town, I went over to Alex's to see if he was even home yet. Or what happened when home. you got there? I knocked on the door, and nobody answered at all. So, so when nobody answered, what did you do? Just go to Racy's, continue on my day. Um, when you left there, I think you're saying you went to Racy's. What did you yes. do when you got to Racy's? When I got to Racy's, I got my favorite drink, a mocha. Okay. And I noticed my friend Max. Before noticing Max, was Jason Mangle at Racy's? Yes, he was out front smoking his usual cigarette, so we just kind of exchanged some quick words. It was brief. Okay. When you go in, you've seen the tape, you're going in. The yes, line. I have. Okay. Then you walk up to the, what do you call that, the counter? Is the bar. The bar? The coffee bar? The coffee bar. Okay, not a bar bar. No. Okay. Um, so you walked up to the coffee bar, and I think yes. you were just saying you talked to Max. Yes. What was your conversation with about Max? Well, after I got my coffee with Max, I was just like, hey, I've got the art, the painting I'd like to give you in my car. I'm in town today doing some errands. I was wondering if you'd want to do the art swap now. Okay. So had you put the painting in your car, when, when you say you were in town to do errands, was that one of the errands that you were hoping to do on that day? Yes. So apparently, was it your original plan? First you'll talk to Alex, and then you'll give, the, then you'll talk to Max and explain yes. the paintings? Yes. Section leading. Uh, that's just me. Okay, I'll rephrase that. What was your plan when you were coming in for the order in which you were planning to do things on that day? Yes, so that day, first I was going to 
well, I gathered my things okay. and I put my painting on the car and I was gonna go talk to Alex and get that done for the day and then I was gonna go to Racy's and see if I could find Max and do the paint swap and then I was gonna see before I had to go home to watch my my little brother now, I was gonna switch over. I had a change of a mail address that needed to be handled. Okay, so after, did you, after seeing Max, what did you do? After seeing Max, he was pretty excited that I had the painting for him and he had this painting he described to me as a cosmic goat that I would really like. So we exchanged those paintings. Um, and after, during this period, there's a picture of your car at Racy's and then yes. returning to Racy's. So what did yes. you do after seeing Max? After seeing Max? Or after going to Max's house. Oh, after going to Max's painting. house, we talked for a little bit. He went inside, grabbed his paintings. We came back to Racy's and I dropped him off, gave him a hug. Did you tell Max what your plan was? Yes. After you were seeing him? What did yes. You, what did you tell him? I told him that I wanted to go over to Alex's house. There was a lot I have to talk about with everybody and I, I definitely wanted to talk to him today. All right. So, um, let me just ask, why did you only have a brief exchange that morning with Jason when you saw him? When I saw him, he seemed kind of occupied. I thought he was busy. All right, was that unusual to you? No. Okay. We've had many times where we just passed. When you left Racy's, yes. after seeing, I, I think that at least they have your return to Racy's here at 11.13, right? Did you yeah. stay at Racy's very long after you dropped Max off again? No, I think I went to the bathroom and got ready to go. And after using the bathroom, where did you go? To Alex's. At the same route as before? Do you know? Do you know the route you took? I take a couple routes to get to Alex's. It's probably the one I take usually, just right over. Okay. And when you got to Alex's house, what did you do? When I got to Alex's house, I parked my car in the driveway and I left it running and I grabbed my, well, his heating pad and such and I went up to the door and I knocked on it. All right, let me ask you about the heating pad. Why did you have a heating pad with you? I had a heating pad because I had some really awful menstrual cramps and I was like complaining about it one day and he's like, oh, here's a heating pad I never use. Why don't you use it? But specifically, maybe my question wasn't clear. Why on that day did you have the heating pad in the car with you and why did you take yes. it to Alex's house? That's what I'm so ask. when talking to an ex, it's, it can always be awkward. It was my way of kind of having an icebreaker, a, bruf, a buffer to start a conversation. Were you planning to do something with the heating pad? Give it back to him, yes. Were you also planning to retrieve anything from his house? Yes, I was hoping that he still had a few clothing items and possibly I left a cup, a, an antique cup there that I really liked. Um, I think last week it was mentioned that the Little Prince, had he ever given you a book, The Little Prince? He had given me two Little Princes. What was the difference between the two of them? The difference between the two Little Princes is that one was a kind of, I call it a children's style book. So it was in English and it was wide and large. And the other little prince he had given to me was a smaller version and it was in French. Had you brought one of those copies previously back to Racy's? Yes, I had. Do you remember which one it was? It was the large child's version as I would call it. So you, um, you go to Alex's house, you ring the bell. Are you afraid of him? No. What happens after you ring the bell? I knock on the door and... Oh, you knocked on the door, not ring the bell? Okay. Yeah. Okay. No bell. Okay. Um, I knock on the door and I hear some kind of shuffling around and I noticed his, his roommate kind of comes down the stairs and pops his head in and then he's gone. <laughs> when you say his roommate, was this anyone you had ever met before? We hadn't met, but I had seen him plenty of times. It was Dave. Had you ever really talked to him, though? No. All right, so he popped his head, and then what did he do after popping his head? That kind of, see? well, I seen that he just kind of seemed like he went and got Alex, and then he just kind of scurried off somewhere. Was uh, Dave Strating dressed when he came to the door? No. <laughs> okay. Um, you said you thought he got Alex. How did, why did you think that? 
Because Alex came down shortly after. And when Alex came down to the door, what happened? Alex looked a little surprised to see me and I said hi and I was like, I have the heating pad and stuff for you. And he took it and he was like, do you want to talk? And it was a quick exchange of words before we went upstairs. When you were going to see Alex, yes. what are the things that you wanted to do or accomplish in having a conversation with him? What I wanted to accomplish in having a conversation with Alex is that I didn't have any... I abruptly broke off our relationship, which I felt was unfair. I thought it was immature, the fact I did it over text, first off. I just wanted to make sure he was okay and how he felt, and I just felt that he had the right to express himself fully about how he felt our relationship was going, how things ended. Just wanted to check in with him. Um, did you also want to talk to him at all about but John been, or anything like that? Yes, I wanted to... I had... I knew that because he was close friends with John that I wanted to ask him about, um, I, it was an apology actually. I was like, I'm sorry if you have to talk to any investigators. I know this situation is uncomfortable. And I wanted to share to him about my counseling and writing I've been doing since it. So with all of these purposes in mind, you go up, yes. you go inside with Alex. Where do you and Alex go? We go to our usual spot, which is his bedroom and I sit on his bed and he's kind of milling about his room and then he sits next to me and we start talking. Are you afraid of him at this time? No. What were you and Alex talking about? Well first I said my apology about I'm sorry that if you're uncomfortable because of there's you might have to talk to an investigator, there's things going on. I also mentioned I seen a photo with my name and with not my name, but my number and some crude words. Do you have any ideas who might be doing this? Are you referring to the Racy's bathroom? Hall? Yes, I'm referring to the Racy's bathroom. Hall. Okay, and so you tell him those things. Yes. And how does the conversation proceed from there? The conversation proceeded from there. I was a bit tearful because I was expressing to him about how upset I was about what had happened and how I had been seeing some help about this and how I was expressing myself, kind of writing, and I was telling him roughly how I felt. Had you brought a knife into the room? No. There was some testimony that uh, I think Jason Mangle said he noticed a knife in the room when he got there. Was that Objection. something you had brought into the room? Hold on. I don't believe there was any such testimony, number one. I don't, I, I don't recall any testimony. Oh, okay. Maybe that's a mistake. Did you bring a knife in the room with you at all? No. Okay. Or did, why not? Objection relevance. I'll rule. You can answer. Thanks. Why didn't you bring a knife up there with you? Well, I didn't bring a knife up there because we were talking. We were spending time together. I don't see any reason for a knife at all. All right. Did you... Um, um, <coughs> Uh, how, do you know how long this conversation was going on? I never wear a watch. I, I'm bad at keeping track of time. So, no, I don't. At some point, as you're having this conversation, let me ask, what's the tone of the conversation between you and Alex as you're having this conversation? In the this tone of our conversation was somber, very solemn between us. We were just, we were both pretty quiet and soft-spoken, and it was just a gentle conversation at that point. And I think, um, did there come a time where something interrupted that conversation? Yes. All right. Um, Judge, do you want to take a lunch break now? Or? Well, I'm just kind of waiting to hear whether there's food. I'd like to go up until uh, they're ready for the jury. We don't, we don't have any word yet, so as oh. soon as we get word... Okay. Uh, we're going to break here real soon. All right. All right. I asked you about an interruption, and I, yes. I am, and you said there was an interruption. What, yes. What did you hear that made you realize there was a, that somebody else was there? What made me realize someone else was there is that I heard a ringtone very loudly, not far outside of the room we were in. I was, like, surprised by that, kind of taken back. I think 
I forgot to ask you this. Had you left, what had you done with your car when you had gotten over to Alex's house? I left it running. Why? I often leave my car running because it's, uh, I don't take care of my car like I should. And there's sometimes when if I don't leave it running for periods of time, it will just not start again. And I also didn't really think I was going to be there that long. Um, are you afraid because your car's running, somebody might steal it? No. Okay. It's an ugly uh, car. When you heard the ringtone, were you saying anything to the Alex about having Jason help him? No. Were you saying let him help you at all? No. Um, was Jason invited to come into the house? No. He just huh. let himself in. All right. So had you heard a knock at the door or the bell ring or anything like that? No, I didn't even know the door had opened. He just kind of burst in. Jason had been led to believe by Ezra that Alex was a dangerous person. He had gotten the journals she had sent, where she wrote about how Alex had destroyed every inch of her in order to make up for the fact that he would never have a love as pure as Jason and hers. He had believed her when she said that Alex told her she was nothing more to him than a fetish, and that he wouldn't take no for an answer, and he felt that he needed to be there to protect her as he hadn't been able to before. Were you surprised, or let me rephrase that, what was your feeling or your emotion when you heard Jason's ringtone? I was surprised and just kind of, it shocked me. I was like, why is he just, right? why did he just let himself in? Like, what's going on? And when Jason all of a sudden shows up on the scene, yes. was there any change that you saw in Alex's demeanor? Yes. Why don't you tell us what that was? After Jason just let himself in into Alex's home, I could tell that Alex, he was no longer sitting next to me like he was. He he stood up and he was very, I call it being bristled, but he seemed on edge. What conversation took place with Jason, you, and Alex in the room? Jason kind of burst into the room and he was just using his hands a lot and he was saying, what's going on? Is everybody okay? And he was talking and I, we're, I, I kind of stepped in and I said, everything's fine. We're fine. We're just talking. And trying to calm him down, I said, we're fine. We can talk in a public place. If Who suggested public place? Kind of all did. We came to this conclusion that we should go somewhere public. But was there something to be afraid of that was going to happen in the bedroom? No. Not even five minutes ago, she was talking about how Alex had manipulated her so intensely that she wanted to commit suicide, that he had made her feel as if she was no longer a person, and he had used his power over her to coerce her into sleeping with him. If that is true, being alone in a bedroom with him was an inherently dangerous place to be. Her denial of this is shocking. So after this conversation with Jason, and again, is, is Alex showing any other reaction or any other part of that conversation? He's, as I said, bristled. He's, he's frustrated. He's a little, um, he started to get quiet. And I always see that as a sign that Alex isn't particularly very happy. Who left the room first? Jason. After Jason left, what did you and Alex do? I kind of looked at him and I said, well, I guess let's, we both kind of were like, oh, I guess we should go somewhere to talk. All right. So did you and Alex leave the room? Yes. Where did you go? We went downstairs and outside. When you get downstairs and outside, what's going on? I was so confused to see that there were police vehicles there and Jason was- Did you was, call the police? No. Did, all right. At the time, did you know how the police happened to be there? No, that's why it took me by surprise so much that all of a sudden there's these two police vehicles, there's police officers. I was just like, what's, what's going on? Did the police officers come and talk to you at all? Yes, they did. Do you remember anything about their conversation? I do, yes. What do you recall? I remember they, the usual police contact. They asked for my license and my name. They asked if everything was fine, and I said... Yeah, we're going somewhere public to speak. Everything's fine. This is, it's, I had no concerns. How long did you talk with the police for? It wasn't very long, no. And when you were talking with the police, was there anything worrisome to you? No. After the police left, 
did uh, were there any words exchanged between you and Jason or Jason and Alex at all? Yes, I had said a few things to Jason. We we talked before we got in the car and let, well, I talked to Jason before he rode off on his bike and then I got back in the car and before we broke for lunch, I was just I think we were at the point where the police had left and you and Alex are now leaving his house. Yes. All right. Whose car were you in? My car. Who was driving? I was driving. When you left Alex's car, did you go to drive, uh, Alex's car, excuse me, your car, Alex's yes. house. Sorry, I'm talking too fast. Did you go to drive anywhere in particular? No. What was your intentions? It was briefly discussed about maybe possibly going to a park or just somewhere in common to speak. We didn't settle on something. As you were driving, were you paying much attention to where you were going? No, just driving. What was the subject of the conversation between you and Alex as you're leaving his house and starting to drive? What we had started talking about is like feelings towards the relationship we had had and he started to now speak about how he felt about my relationship with Jason and how he felt about our relationship ending. What was Alice's mood or demeanor during this conversation? Alex was very solemn and he seemed frustrated. As he was talking and you were talking, yes. um, what was happening to you and your feelings? I started feeling anxious after our conversation being abruptly interrupted. I just, and now we were driving and talking about me and Jason and things like that. I started to feel anxious, just uneasy. What did you do as a result of that anxiety? As a result of my anxiety, I asked him if it would be all right if he could drive for a while. How did he respond? He said, yes, yeah, I can drive. It's fine. So what happened after he told you he could drive? After we briefly parked, we switched drivers, and he started to drive me. Do you know where you were at that particular point? No. When he was driving at that point, did the conversation continue? Yes. Were you paying attention at all to where he was going? No, I was trying to focus on what he was saying. D uh, did you know where he was going or direct him to a certain direction at all? No, we were just driving. What was the conversation about then? The conversation was more led by him at this point, and he was voicing his opinion about my continuation of the relationship with Jason. As a reminder, Ezra had told Alex that the relationship with Jason was toxic and abusive. So much so, he wrote in his own journals about how Jason was an abusive partner to her. Even if he didn't have romantic feelings towards her, he was well within his right to believe her getting back together with a 33-year-old was a bad idea. But he wasn't alone in not liking the idea of her getting back together with the medic. Because, if you recall, Ezra had told everyone in her life that Jason was a horrible person. Ezra's mother, father, and all of her friends agreed with this particular assessment as well, and repeatedly asked Ezra why she would want to be back together with a man she claimed to have been so horrible to her. And as that conversation to continued, was there at some point that Alex stopped the car? Yes. Do you know where that was? It was just some road. We just stopped. When he stopped the car, what happened? When he when we stopped the car, well, when he stopped the car, he just we we sat there for a moment, and a car passed us. Not much happened other than he started to pull into what seemed like a driveway. And was this okay? Just to clarify, where he initially pulled the car over, was it on the muddy road or was it on a paved road? It was on a paved road. Lean turning into the muddy road is the best way to describe it. All right, but at that point, had he completely gone onto the muddy road yet? No. After um, he decided to start driving again, yes. what did he do? He started driving, he proceeded to drive up the muddy road, and that's when we started to get stuck. 
first of all, you've seen the pictures with the gate at the Money Road. Was the yes. gate open or closed? It was open. All right. So when you say he got stuck or started to get stuck, what do you mean? As we started to drive up this muddy road, it's kind of at an incline. We got stuck in the mud the first time. Um, was there conversation about why he was driving up the muddy road? No. Well, it was just kind of, this seems like a nice place to stop, I guess. All right. Was there a plan to do something? once To get out and... We both love nature, so to get out, maybe look around a bit, explore, talk. When he got the car stuck, what happened? When he got the car stuck in the road, I said, I can take over. I think I can pull it out of the mud. So we, had, we then again switched drivers. What happened when you decided you were going to try to... Uh, well, let me ask you first. Had you ever been to this place before? No, I've never seen it before. Did you know where you were? No. You get in the driver's seat. Were you able to move the car? Yes. Were you able to do that without the assistance of any objects? Just, yes. Okay. How, and once you were able to move the car, where was Alex sitting when you did that? Or where was Alex? I'm sorry. That's what I meant to ask. Alex was in the passenger seat with me. When you were able to move the car, what did you do? I was able to move the car because I maneuvered it onto what seemed to be grass, so it wasn't muddy. It <coughs> seemed like the frost hadn't given out yet. So I proceeded to drive up this hill of sorts, and then I got stuck in the mud. You've seen the pictures of your car stuck in the mud? Yes. Did your car ever move again while no. you were there? Let me ask you now, you're stuck in the mud. Yes. What efforts do you make to get unstuck? Well, I tried your typical backing up a little bit, moving forward, maybe turning the wheel this way, turning the wheel that way a little bit. But You mean you turn the wheel to right and to left? Since? Yes, okay. to see if anything would help get this out of the mud. But it just the, the tires at one point just started spinning. There was no use. It goes without saying that for a person recounting what they insist is the most traumatic experience they'd ever gone through, their behavior is highly unusual. Though she hasn't begun recounting the fictional details of the assault, she is talking about her last memories with Alex, a person she, within the past three hours, has claimed to have loved and deeply cared for. And yet the only time she has shown any emotion other than a strange, smug happiness has been when she had to point out her doodles in Alex's notebook. She hasn't displayed any sadness or anxiety when discussing seeing Alex for the last time. There's no trepidation or fear, and everything feels incredibly rehearsed. But it also feels like she is enjoying her time on the stand. It feels like she's the lead in a high school play. Um, did Alex get out and try to help push at all? No. And did you try to use any objects to get yourself unstuck? I looked for some in my car, yes, after we stopped. Okay, first of all, did you look for things in the inside of your car? Yes. What did you look for in the inside of your car? I was hoping there would be a brick in my car, board, anything I can use to wedge under maybe one of the tires to gain some traction. Did you find anything you could do that with? No. Did you look in the trunk of your car? Yes. What did you look for in the trunk of your car? I looked for the same thing, but there wasn't anything that I wanted to have to stick under my tire and see it break or get ruined. W was there something specific in your trunk you didn't want to get ruined? My tent. And did at some point you take a blanket out? Yes, a, I took a blanket out when I was looking in the back of my car, kind of in the back footwells, in the, in the seat area. I set it on the ground near the open door. I wasn't too concerned that it was on the ground. Okay. When you say the open door, which door are you referring to? The driver's side back seat door. Why was that door open? The door was open so that I could look for anything. And did you ever close that door? No. What about a pillow? Did you take a pillow out at all? Yes, a pillow had come out when I took the blanket out. So that just happened? Yes, it just happened. Okay. So you're in the 
um, mud, you're yes. stuck. Yes. What is Alex doing to try to help you get unstuck? At that point, he was very quiet. He wasn't doing really much. He was, he kind of stepped back and he seemed like he was just letting me look and try to figure this out. Um, the things that were in your trunk, I know there's um, been um, some pictures shown that there's a couple of knives back in the trunk. Yes. Were you aware those were in there? Not consciously, no. Do you know how they got in the back of your trunk? There's always various one, knives from moving place to place between my mom's and my dad's and from there was a lot of things in my trunk from moving out of my apartment so they somewhere between moves was one of those knives something jason had given you yes and what condition was it in it was one of the clasps was broken we also saw a picture of what looked like a steak knife or a kitchen knife yes did you know that was in there? I didn't know that was in there, no. Did you take those knives out at any time? No. Did you go into your center council to try and get anything to move the car? No, I didn't really look in there. Um, at some point, did Alex get out of the car too? Yes. And at some point, did you move other items from around in your car in the back seat? Just as, well, let me, what I want to ask you about is the paintings Max gave you. Do you yes. know if you moved those at all? I did move the paintings. One of the paintings was upright, so I moved it to the front seat. I didn't want it to get ruined in me rummaging around. And the other painting had slipped under the seat. So when you moved that painting, the larger yes. painting, or maybe we could call the abstract painting? Yes. Where was Alex at that point? Alex was outside of the car. After not finding anything to move the car, um, yes. what was what were you going to do next? Breathe. I was feeling, I was like, how oh, great. I don't know where I am. I have no idea. I'm stuck in the mud. I don't know what to do. Just, I need to breathe. I'm just going to show you this diagram that has been used previously. It's exhibit number 285. Thank you. And just to orient you. Yes. Do you understand what the, is being shown I here? I do. Okay. So. This diagram shows tire marks in two different places. Yes. All right. The diagram shows two pillows. Is that the pillow I was asking you about? Yes, it's my pillow. Okay. And although I'm sure it's marked on here, it's not. The diagram shows a blanket? Yes. All right. Now, this is your car. Did you notice something next to your car by where you were stuck? Yes, I noticed a large, what seemed to be military trailer. At some point, did you go over by that trailer? Yes. Why? I. It was a bit tall for me to look inside, but I kind of peeked at it to see if there might have been something. I stopped focusing on it and I decided to go sit just kind of on the hitch of the trailer. Okay, do you see this pointed object near where it says trailer? Yes. Is that a visual, though not accurate, representation of the hitch? Yes. So when you went over to the hitch, what did you do? I went over to the hitch of the trailer and I decided to sit on it and I was just trying to breathe through the anxiety and the feelings of being stuck, not knowing where I am. And I was just kind of looking out into the woods, sitting on this hitch of sorts. During the time that you're sitting and looking out into the woods, was Alex talking with you at all? He was behind me, but he was at my car at that point. Was he in your line of vision or how, let me just ask this, how did you know he was at your car? I could hear him open and close the door. Was he talking to you at all? No. During this time, were you facing towards Alex or away from Alex? I was facing away from Alex towards the woods. Did there come a time where, as you were facing away from Alex towards the woods, that he approached you at all? Yes, he had approached me from behind. Well, since he's from behind, how do you know he's there? I could feel him. I could feel that he was there. I could hear him approach. I could feel just that somebody was behind me. When he approached, 
what happened? As I was sitting there, he approached me from behind and he, he wrapped his arms around me. It was kind of a hug. He held me there for a little while. Did you say anything? I, I kind of tensed. I didn't really reciprocate the hug. And it was, it was kind of a silent moment between us, but I felt awkward and uneasy and I wasn't, I wasn't in a, it wasn't a time for me to feel like I wanted a hug, I guess. This is a new portion of the story that Ezra is so graciously telling us in court. As you probably recall, in her previous interviews about what had happened, she claimed that when they got stuck in the mud, something she claimed was entirely Alex's fault, she went to the back seat of the car to try and see if there was anything they could use to put under her back tires to get some traction. She went outside, bent over, looking for something to use, when Alex came up from behind her and began assaulting her. That is the story she told to the police. But that, quite literally, could not have happened based on the footprints that were found at the scene. Ezra had hoped that by the time the police found the body, the footprints would have been erased by nature. But thankfully, that wasn't the case. Once again, you have to ask yourself, why would Ezra lie about this to the detectives? If the end result is the same, as she is still claiming that Alex's actions put her in fear for her life, then what was the point of claiming that the assault happened in this particular way? Why would she leave out this point in her retelling? It's only when you understand what her lies are in service of that you understand why she's lying about these things. She lied to the police about the area where she and Alex drove to in order to keep the police from finding the body, until the crime scene would no longer show what she had done. She lied about losing her memory so she wouldn't have to say definitely what happened to the police until she knew what they could and could not prove she did. She lied about where the attack took place because she had attempted to move Alex's body back outside but gave up halfway through, and so on and so forth. If we wanted to, we could even go through the lies she told throughout the relationship and determine why she told those as well, but we still have another 45 minutes of footage to go over. And I'm sure everybody has already clicked off of this video at this point, because what are we even looking at? So let me know if you're still there. Let me ask you something else. Do you know whether or not Alex had a phone with him? Yes. Did you have a working phone with you? No. Um, you had your iPod, I gather. Yes. Uh, and the phone without the minutes? Yes. All right. Did you ask Alex at any point to make a phone call on his phone to try and get um, no. a tow truck? No. Did I he did offer to make any calls or try to get a tow truck? It was a very brief kind of quick conversation about, should we call somebody for this? And I was like, I can handle it, I think. So no, we did not make a phone call. All right, you could handle it, but you hadn't been able to move the car. What are you thinking when you're saying I can handle this? What I'm thinking is I don't want to get my car towed because of how expensive it is. I didn't want to have to pay for that. Okay. Not to belabor this point, but Ezra didn't really pay for anything in her life. That morning, when she had gotten coffee at Racy's, she had paid for it and left a tip, which was so entirely out of character for her that everyone who knew her took notice of that fact. She usually got her coffees for free because she had purposely become friends with everyone who worked there. Or, if they told her they couldn't comp her coffees, she would get another patron to cover it for her, as she would talk to everyone who entered the shop. Even when she was employed, she very rarely bought things for herself, instead relying on Jason or her parents to purchase things for her. She had never paid rent, or even paid for any of her own bills. Given the fact that Alex was employed and in love with her, it's more than likely that if they'd gotten the car towed, she would have made him pay for it. So let's go back to him coming over. He gives you a hug. Yes. What happens after he gives you the hug? After he gives me the hug and I, I tense, I think he felt that because he let go after he held me for a while. And I think he could see that I was breathing. I was trying to breathe through some anxiety and he suggested that maybe I should go lay down or look around in the car again. Okay, when you say you were breathing, can you describe what you mean to the to all of us? What I mean is I'm I'm sitting there and I'm just all of, I, a lot is running through my mind and I was breathing heavily. I just there I was my anxiety was heightened at that time. I was trying to breathe through it, so I was trying to deeply breathe. It wasn't working too well. Is deep breathing something you've used to try to control anxiety? Yes. 
Alex letting go of Ezra after he realized that the hug wasn't being reciprocated and that she didn't appreciate his touch goes directly against how the defense is attempting to portray him. He felt that she didn't appreciate being touched, so he stopped touching her. That also does not align with how she reframed his journals earlier. If Alex believed that consent came secondary to what he wanted, why would he respect her boundaries in that moment? Continuing on, it seems as if she just remembered that she should be anxious in this moment. Her lawyer asks her about if she has to focus on breathing in order to quell her anxiety, and she takes almost a comedically deep breath, doing exaggerated shoulder movements up and down. The only other time she has done this was when she was looking at her doodles in Alex's notebook, but it seems like she just realized that she wants to portray herself as a deeply anxious person. So, she should at least appear to be dealing with anxiety while on trial for murder. Did Alex say anything else to you after he had eventually come over? He suggested that I might want to lay down for a while and maybe just relax. What did you think when Alex said that? I just shrugged and was like, all right, maybe. And I decided to walk back towards the car. When you walked back to the car, did you go in the car? I went into the car, yes. Where in the car did you return? I returned to the car. I returned to the driver's side back door was open and I approached into the car. I kind of looked around a little bit, moved some things a little more and that's how I was getting into the car was from the back. Why were you going to the back seat and not the front seat? I was thinking maybe he's right. I need to lay down for a little bit. Did you lie down? I did. At some point after lying down, did Alex join you? Yes, he did join me. How were you laying down when he came over? When he came over, I was still, when he first came over, I was still in a somewhat crouched position. So I felt him while well, I heard him approach and I laid down. I got into the car further and I laid down on my back. When you laid on the back, what happened with Alex? When I laid down, Alex had started to come into the car with me and posi position himself above me. He's, you could say, straddled. Was to be clear, according to the blood evidence and the evidence at the scene, the first time Alex was stabbed was in the back as he walked away from Ezra. This entire portion of her testimony is all fabricated. As such, I will not be pausing every time she says something that is false. Alex speaking to you at that point? Yes, he started to speak to me at this point, yes. Can you tell us the words you heard Alex speak to you? <coughs> what he said to me at this time was he started to describe me and not in, in a third person sense. And he also started to speak of how he deserves this. Well, l let's just stop because I don't know what you mean by he describes you in a third person sense. Can you tell us specifically what you remember him saying? Specifically what I remember him saying is, Ezra is beautiful. Ezra is my shining sun. Ezra, in the sense he kept saying my name and then something after that. Ezra is so handsome. All right, so Ezra is beautiful. Ezra is my shining sun. Ezra is handsome. Had he ever talked to you that way before? He hadn't talked to me. He's he said pet names before. He's sweet talked to me before, but this was different because it was disconnected. It was third person. So in other words, are you like before he would say, you are this, you are that? He would say, you're beautiful, you're handsome, you're this, you're that. But at this point, at this time, he was saying, Ezra is, instead of, it was more as if I was an object. After he's saying Ezra is beautiful, Ezra is... that last comment, it uh, calls for speculation. That's how uh, she felt. I believe that's perfectly admissible. Are you objecting to the previous question before yes, the answer? Yes, previous answer before counsel started again. I'm going to overrule it. Go ahead. All right. So you're feeling um, that he's referring to as an object. What else are you feeling at that point? At that point, 
I'm not so sure how to really think about what was happening. I was a little confused because it he hadn't come on to me earlier that day. I didn't think he was going to do this. I was starting to feel my anxiety come back full force. Did he do anything with respect to uh, your glasses? Yes, he started to do things slowly and methodically. He first removed my glasses. When your glasses are off, can you see? No, not at all. Barely past a couple inches in front of my face. So when he removed your glasses, what were you able to see? I was able to see that he was in front of me. I was, that's, I can't see much. I think you were saying that in addition to his referring to you in the third person, he was also saying something else. Can you tell me what else you heard? That I was handsome and that I, he deserved this. He, I had betrayed him. I went back to Jason. He was upset about this and that he deserved me. If we were to refer back to Alex's journals when he spoke of Ezra and how he felt secondary in her life, he felt that it was a reflection on him. He felt that he was not good enough for her, that she deserved better, and that she would always pick Jason over him, and so on. His journals indicate that he was an incredibly depressed individual who had to work to find anything worthwhile about himself. He was not a self-important, confident person who believed he should own Ezra, and in every single journal they have used to try and prove this point, he has said that. She's also, of course, smiling slightly when she says this, which could be a duping delight smile, but regardless, her general tone and behavior is not aligned with what she is saying. She's also seemed to have already forgotten to try and seem like she was having a hard time breathing due to anxiety. I guess she thought that one sigh would convince people enough, or maybe she thought getting stuck in the mud was more anxiety-inducing than taking the stand for a murder trial. After Alex says he deserved you and takes off your glasses, what does he do? He then takes my scarf and he places it over my eyes and I felt his hand on my face and he asked me if I could see him and I told him no I cannot. So he puts this, you tell him you can't see him, what does he do next? After he asks me a few times if I can see him and I tell him no I can't see you Alex. I. I can't see him, but I can feel him start to touch my clothes. What's going through your head? What's going through my head at this time is, I don't know what he, I, I was assuming what I thought I knew what he wanted and I wasn't sure and I was anxious and I, what was going on was going through my head. Were you going to tell him to stop? I hadn't really voiced much until after he had kissed me. Then, after kissing you, but about the other things he was doing, touching oh. your clothes, caressing you, or whatever he did, I'm not sure what he did, but... No, I just was quiet and I was still. Okay, I want to get back to his actions as you were quiet. Yes. What is he doing besides kissing you? What does he do? After he kisses me and I pull my head back a bit, I felt he touched the hem of my sweater. I could feel a pull on it. And I wasn't sure at the time really what he was doing, but I could feel it start to give away. It felt looser and my sweater had been opened. Did you know how he had opened your sweater? I, after I felt my sweater start to give away, I took off the scarf and I could see that he was cutting my sweater. All right. When he kissed you, did you tell him to stop? Yes. Why stop, say stop about the kissing? He didn't ask me if he could kiss me. I couldn't see he was going to do it. I just, it was so sudden and it caught me off guard and... I didn't, it was strange. It caught you off guard. You asked him to stop. Did he stop kissing you or continue? He, kiss, he tried to kiss me again, but I tried to pull away with my limited room where I was. 
So now he's cut your sweater open. Do you tell him stop then? No, I froze. What does he do after he cuts your sweater? After he cuts through my sweater, he then starts to cut through my second shirt. Do you move then? No. Why not? I'm just trying to breathe. I'm frozen. I don't know what to do. When you I'm... say frozen, what do you mean? What I mean when I'm frozen is that I'm just, I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm limp. I'm, I'm not moving or resisting or fighting. I'm just, I'm there. Why? I didn't know what to do. After he cuts through your shirt, what's the very next thing you feel? The next thing I feel is that my second shirt starts to get cut. And I can feel that he's cutting it, but I also feel a slight prick or something. And after that, he moves to my pants. Were you able to see what he was cutting with? Yes. What was it? It was a knife. Now, about that knife, had you taken that knife out during the time that you were stuck? No. Um, when you came back to the car before you got in the back seat, had you noticed that something was different? I noticed something was different. I looked in. I looked into the front of my car, and I noted how it was strange that my wallet was out of the console and that my middle console was open. I thought it was strange. Let me take you back to the cutting. So yes. He's cut through your sweater. He's cut through your shirt. He's cut a little bit into your t-shirt. You have felt something on your neck. Yes. Stomach, I believe. And after that, what does he do next? After that. He starts to cut through my pants. He's starting near the button, well, below that. It's on the front of my pants or the inner thigh, you can say. I can feel that he's pulled on it to give room so that he can cut through. Was there, besides your pants, was he cutting through anything else at this point? At this point, he had cut through my tights as well. Where on your pants and your tights has he cut through at this point? At this point, he had cut through the inner thigh area of my pants and tights. After he's cutting through your pants and your tights, what happens next? Do you feel anything different at some point? What was different at this point is that I could feel the knife start to graze and cut into my skin. Where in your skin do you feel it? I feel it on <clears throat> my vagina. I feel it. It's inside the hip region, I could just feel a pinch and I could feel that the knife had been meeting contact with me. Are you moving? A pinch or a prick is a good way to describe the slight pain she would be in when she was cutting her hand with the knife after the murder. Because to be clear, she never tried to take the knife away from Alex. As we covered in our previous video, men and women who have survived attacks like the kind Ezra is talking about have discussed how, in order to save their lives, they were forced to grab the weapon of their attacker and this left them with a deep wound, and some having their hands nearly severed. But when in that position, they were driven to act. The cuts on Ezra's hands, arms, legs, and thighs were all surface level and indicated that they were placed there purposely. She wanted to give the impression that she had been in a struggle, so she harmed herself but she wasn't willing to injure herself in any significant way. What happens when, well, you decided to name the groin. Did you actually do it? Yes. What happens then? He reacts and he drops the knife at that point. This is in addition to her narrative that, once again, she had no reason to keep from the detectives when she confessed to the crime. Again, in every iteration of what she claims happened, she has been the victim. She was the one forced to act to protect herself, and that doesn't change throughout her retellings. So why would she lie about this? Why wouldn't she tell the police this? When he drops the knife, what do you do? Instantly, I grab the knife, and I have pulled, I've used my arm to pull myself into the footwell, and that's when it, that's when everything really starts to happen. All right, I'm going to talk to you about everything starting to happen. You have the knife. Yes. What are you doing with the knife? At this point, I have the knife. I'm trying to get out of the car. I just need, I need to get out. I need to get away is all I'm saying. And I can't get out of the car, and he's still grabbing for me. And this is when I began to defend myself and stab Alex. 
Now, you're saying you want to get out of the car. You're no longer lying down on the seat with your head by the passenger side door. Where in the car are you at this point as you're trying to get out and you're holding this knife? At this point, when the knife is my, in my hand, I am trapped between the open door and the middle of the car, so where the console would be, or the seat. You said you grabbed the knife and you yes. start stabbing. Yes. Where's the back? Where's your back at that point, or which direction are you facing it? I'm facing. What would be forward at this point is the rear of the car. I'm facing Alex, but I my back is pressed against the driver. Where is Alex? Alex is in front of me. He's in between. He's not directly in front of me, but he's in between me and the door. Are you trying to get out? Yes. You said you're unable to get out, so what do you start doing? What I start doing is defending myself. I was, as Alex is grabbing me, I started stabbing him anywhere and everywhere I could. I didn't know what was happening. I just needed to get away. I just needed to get out of the car. Were you consciously aiming for any particular place when you were stabbing him? No, it was just, it was happening fast and it, it was anywhere and everywhere. Do you have any memory of the order in which you stabbed him at all? No. Do you have um, any memory in particular of him uh, attacking you as you're stabbing? Yes, as I'm trying to get out of this car as I'm trying to make my way to the open door, Alex grabs me by the throat and I'm pressed, my body and my head is pressed against the driver's side back of the seat. And is this happening before you stabbed him, as you're starting, do you remember? It's happening as it was, as I was stabbing him. Okay, so he's grabbing you by the throat. Do you, you saw a red mark from these pictures on your throat? Yes. Is that where he was grabbing you? Yes. And besides grabbing you in the throat, what else is he doing to you? Do you know? His hand slips from my throat and it moves to the back of my head where he grabs my hair. What happens when he grabs your hair? Do you remember? I remember as he grabbed my hair, he was holding it very tight and he was pulling my face towards him. And I remember that's when I had stabbed him inside the head. Why did you do that? I, it was a response to being pulled so close to his face. When you did that and you're stabbing him and he's grabbing you by the throat, he's pulling your hair, um, as this is going on, at some point does he let go? Yes. When he lets go, what does he do? He didn't just let go, he had ripped my hair out from my head and he then got out of the car. I haven't been pausing every time her story disconnects with the evidence, as we've already gone over what the evidence shows happened in the case, but he did not rip her hair out of her head. Again, this is a new addition, one that if happened, there would be evidence of, but there isn't. When he gets out of the car, well, let me ask this, first of all, before he gets out of the car and you're doing the stats, are you trying to kill him? No. What are you trying to do? I just want to get away. I need to get out of the car. I need to get away as fast as I could. So why do you keep stabbing him while you're still in the car? Because he wouldn't let go. He wouldn't let me out. I was terrified. He wouldn't let go of you? No. Where? My throat and my head. When he lets go and he goes out of the car, do you run after him and keep stabbing him? No, I was... What do you do? I was crumpled. I was inside the car still, and I was sitting inside the car on the driver's side seat. At some point, do you get out of the car? Yes. And where is Alex at that point in time? Alex is standing up near what was the green trailer. Did Alex say something to you as he's standing up there? Yes. I was confused. I didn't well, I just want you to tell us what he said what to he me. Said. What I heard him say to me was that he needed help to go to the bathroom. He needed help doing this. So Alex has just been stabbed in the groin, head, and chest. But the only thing he says to Ezra, the person who stabbed him after, is that he needed help going to the bathroom. 
That doesn't make any sense either. He's been stabbed in the head. He would be screaming, trying to get away from her, trying to call the police or emergency services. But instead, he walked over to the green trailer and told her he needed help going pee. Sure. Again, Ezra has to account for the fact that blood was found outside of the car despite her original story, that the entire attack took place inside of the car. She needs to account for why the crime scene investigators were able to state that the first place Alex was stabbed was by the green trailer, and the fact that the evidence showed he was then chased to the car, being stabbed along the way. And the completely reasonable story they have settled on is that directly after attempting to sexually assault Ezra, and subsequently being stabbed in the head, chest, and groin, he walked away from the car and told her that he needed help to pee. When he said to you he needs help going to the bathroom, what do you do? I instantly just wanted to help him, so I got out of the tr car and I approached him. When you approached him, what? how are you feeling when you approach him? Disconnected and dizzy and full of ink. I couldn't breathe. Well, if you're so afraid, why do you go by him? I just wanted to help. It's my first response is to help someone. So you go by him, you're going to yes. help him. Yes. And at this point, what does he do? When I go to approach to help him, I come near him, and this is when he grabs me again, and he pulls me very close and tight to his body. Where's the knife? Because that makes sense. He was just stabbed by her, but he's going to hug her. I don't know if anyone here has been stabbed before, but as someone who's been stabbed by farm equipment due to a machine error, it's not a fun experience. You don't just kind of walk away from that and then go about your day. The knife is in my hand still. When he pulls you close and tight to your body, what are you thinking? He's going to kill me. What do you do as you're thinking he's going to kill you? I s reached around and just quickly stabbed him in the side, hoping he would let go. Why do you think he's going to kill you at this point as he's grabbing you close? I thought he was going to pull me down to the ground and get the knife. Why do you reach around and stab him? Why, I mean, are you not face to face or? It's because I'm pulled tight to his body and that was the only place my arm could go. Did you stab him any more after that? No. All right, after this last stab wound, where do you go? I retreated back into the car and I sat there shivering. When you're doing that, were you watching at all what Alex was doing? Yes. What did you see him do? Alex took his coat off and he laid it on the ground near the trailer and then he proceeded to lay down on the coat. You know, I think I had forgotten to ask you, but in this earlier struggle in the car, had your boots come off at all? Yes, one of my boots had come off. Do you know which one it was? No. And did you later take off another boot? Yes. Had you done that yet at this point? No. He's laying on his coat. Can you, is he talking at all? I could hear him speaking, yes. Can you hear what he's saying? I, I could hear him saying that he had been waiting for this for so long. I heard him saying strange things about roommates and he just kept saying he's been waiting for this for so long. After you hear that, what do you do? I was still in the car at that point and I was breathing and I kept saying out loud what's happening, what's going on. And this is when I decided I needed to go. I needed to get away. All right, so you decide you need to go. Um, are you kind of like almost feeling like things are black at all, or are you conscious, or what's going on with you? I'm feeling like, like it's, things are, I feel dizzy and faint, that I can't catch my breath, that things are starting to go black at the sides. It felt like I was in a tunnel, like I could only see so much around me. Does Alex keep talking, or eventually, or, you know, does he stop at some point? He was not talking anymore at that point. And at, when you're in the car, do you find your glasses? Yes. Was this the first time you found your glasses? Yes. Up until that point, had, you had problems with what you could see? Yes, I couldn't see at all. I hadn't put my glasses on yet. When you put your glasses on, what, what do you do next? I put my glasses on and I could see everything 
and I'm sorry. This is the point when I decided I needed to go. I needed to get out of there. I was panicking. I couldn't breathe. Did you see a phone? Yes. Whose phone? I seen Alex's phone. Did you take it? Yes. Why? In my head, I wanted to call the police. I wanted to get help. I wanted to do anything I could do. So in her head, she wanted to call the police and get help. But in reality, she didn't call the police and get help, and his phone ended up broken. Seemingly, after being smashed by a rock on the outside of Don Sipple's farm, where she appeared. Right, at that point, you're thinking that as you leave the car, do you still have the knife? Yes. What do you do with that knife? What I did with that knife is I looked down and I opened my sleeve with the tip of it and I hastily scratched the word boy into my arm. Okay, everyone wants to know, why did you scratch boy into your arm? I've thought about it and when I think about this, I don't know. At that time, it's something that just happened. It was just a reaction. I really, I'm, I don't know why I did this. Again, she grabbed the phone to call emergency services, a move that would have saved Alex's life. But instead of calling them, she cut the word boy into her arm because she doesn't have a reason. That's fucking great. She carved the word boy into her arm to implicate Alex as being the perpetrator of sexual violence against her. She didn't have any evidence that he'd been violent against her, but she knew that in his journals, he had referred to her by masculine pronouns as it was something that she stated that she liked at the time. She tried to recontextualize that to the police as being a spiteful, cruel thing that he did, something that she found apparently to be objectifying. Had you ever cut yourself before? Yes. When had you cut yourself before? In the past, when I had cut myself on my arm was at times when I felt like I couldn't breathe when I felt numb, when I felt like I needed to act because I couldn't feel anything. It woke me up in a sense. Did you feel that way at this time? Yes. Objection. Relevance. I know 402 or 404, I mean. I think I'm asking about her feelings right afterwards. We're right in this incident. I'm asking her what she's feeling. I'm going to overrule. Go ahead. Continue. Thank you. All right. I, you've already said how you feel. After you cut boy in your arm, do you know where you were when you did that? At that point is when I was trying to... I was staying away from Alex because of the fear. I was at the end of the car, and I had my hand placed on the back of the car. After you cut boy in your arm, what do you do? Well, first of all, are, is your second shoe on at this point? No. When you leave, where is Alex? Alex is still laying on his coat. Do you know or did, had you noticed whether or not he had his shoes on at that point or not? He still had his shoes on at that point. And when you say he's laying on his coat, where is he laying on his coat? He's laying on his coat near the green trailer. You've cut boy in your arm. Yes. You told Detective Proc that you wouldn't forget. You did to not forget. Today you're saying you're searching your mind and you just don't know. There's so many things I could think that it, it could be, but at I search my mind, and when I think about this, I really just don't know the answer. Where do you go after you have cut boy in your arm? After I cut boy in my arm, I started to make my way down that dirt driveway. You told Detective Proc that you could not get this outside of your head. What did you mean by that? I couldn't get the feeling outside of my head. I couldn't get the panic the the visual of the horror of seeing Alex and seeing the blood. You, some of the things that you've said in court, but what I meant to ask you before that was, the way you've related this is a little bit different than some of what you related to Detective Proc when you told him what happened. Yes. A couple of days later. And do you have an ex explanation or know why you remember this a little differently now? 
I've had time to process it. I've had time to process it. I, and the moment after, well, speaking to Proc, it was fresh, all of the feelings. I was feeling the emotions and the sights, and now I've had significant amount of time to process what has happened to me. When there is a processing of what happened, and then there is changing one's original story to try and make it fit the evidence that was found in the case. You told him then that you couldn't get it out of your head. Was it like replaying it in order? Was no. it fragments? Was it here and there? Was it, you it know? It was fragments. It was even smells. It was just a mix of parts of what had happened. Okay. I'm going to have to take you back now to going to the farmer's house. Yes. To Mr. Sipples, okay? Yes. What do you remember about going there? I remember a farmer, he took me into his house, sat me down, and got me a blanket. Before you got to his house, where were you going? I mean, do you remember how you got there at all? I just remember stumbling down a road, falling on a paved road a few times, just feeling like I could barely get my feet to move. And I noticed some cars in a driveway and I thought, someone's home, I have to, I have to see if someone's home. Do you know at all when you fell, um, what happened to the, well, first of all, you were carrying the knife and the phone, I think. Yes. Like that. When you fell, did something happen to those? When I fell the first time, I had hit my hand very hard in the phone. I dropped the phone and I broke the phone. And what about the knife? The knife I just dropped. Were you trying to hide them? No. I think you were talking about what Mr. Sipple did when you got there. Yes. When you got there, Was there some point where somebody asked you your name? Yes. Do you remember at all what you said when you were there? I, no. Do you know whether when you were there, what your state of mind was? I was just panicked. Okay, I'm going to ask you about your name, Monica Carlin. Yes. You've heard the testimony that you gave your name as Monica Carlin. Yes, right? I've heard that. And I think as you're saying now, you don't remember doing that. No. Was there an earlier time in your life when you had a traumatic car accident? Yes. What happened then? Objection, Your Honor. May we approach? Yes. I believe I was asking about a traumatic accident you once had with a horse. Yes. Can you just briefly tell me about that? I had just gotten my license and I was returning some movies to town and I was driving my car and... and first of all, how old were you? You said you'd just gotten your license. 16. Okay. I was driving and a horse and buggy bolted through a stop sign and went through my windshield. After that happened and the horse went through your windshield, what happened to you? I was taken to the hospital by ambulance. A couple of years later, did you have another car accident? Yes, I did. When you had the second car accident, what did you do that time? That time, I had blacked out and opened my eyes, and I was in the ditch on the side of the highway. I had gone through a fence. After you were on the ditch on the side of the highway, did you go to the hospital again? Yes. Who visited you there? My mother and my boyfriend at the time, Jason. And when you were in the hospital, did what were they what were you talking about at the hospital the second time? The second time at the hospital, when I woke up, I was asking, Where's the horse? Is the horse okay? Is everybody okay? I was, was there a horse in the second accident? No, I had I was right back into the first accident I had had. And what name did you give after that? I gave my name Monica. Do you know this because you remember it, or were the people who with you told you you had done this? The people that were with me 
had told me that this had, was happening. Your Honor, I'm going to object to this as being hearsay. All right, sustained on hearsay. And no. ask that, and that, that be last stricken. Last answer would be stricken. Okay. Now, after um, I'm going to go back to this. So when you're at the farmer's house, yes. Are you aware of just happened to you? Of what had just happened to you at that point? At that point, I was. I wasn't aware of much other than being panicked and terrified and hurt. You said you were attacked by them. Is them a word you would use referring to a singular person? Yes. And why do you sometimes call a singular person them or they? I've been known to do this many times. It's a pronoun that I've been used, that I've been used to using. It's neutral. Did you, you said you were attacked, but without giving details when you were there. Why was that? I said I was attacked because the feeling of fear of having to get away from this individual, of feeling like someone was coming or that I was hurt by someone and that something had happened. I looked down at my clothes and I could see they were open and I was terrified. The police came. Did you talk to the police? Yes. Do you have any memory of those conversations? No. Do you know um, how you got to the hospital? By ambulance. Do you have any memory of that ambulance ride? No. What about getting to the hospital? Do you remember what happened once you got to the hospital? I remember bits and pieces of what had happened when I got to the hospital because they had started to take my clothes. Do you remember doctors, nurses, anything else? It's all, I barely remember faces. It's a, it's a blur of movement and people checking in and people being with me constantly and talking to me and asking me questions and prodding and poking at me. Do you remember um, any of your statements to the police that day? That day, the first night at the hospital? No. Was there a point in the hospital where your memory began to return to you? Yes. When was that? The point when things started to flood back to me was when I finally was able to take a shower that night. And I went to get some soap or shampoo from the wall, and when I pumped it onto my hand, I felt how much it stung. And I looked down, and I could see my hand was cut. and. I could feel everything start to come back. That's weird, because she only seemed to remember what happened to her when she was made aware that Alex's body had been found and her story made no fucking sense. Almost like she was lying about not remembering, which she actually did admit to the detectives. But now she remembered the night before the second interview because her hand stung, and she just continued to state she didn't remember right after because she thought it would be fun and nice. Nice. Was that, all right, let me start that. The next day, Detective Proc came to see you. Yes. Do you remember talking to him? It's, I do remember speaking with him, yes. Do you remember? She was likely going to say some form of partially, but decided against it, which isn't the best thing to do when you're on the stand. Actively changing your answer once you've already begun to talk just makes you look like you're lying. But she is lying, so I guess it makes sense. Were you speaking with him twice, or is it a blur, or how do you recall that? My talks with Proc, when I remember them, it feels like it's just one interview. It doesn't feel distinctly two different interviews for me. All right. Whether you remember it as one or two, Detective Proc came to see you the next day, and he was asking you where Alex was. Yes. And the next day, when he's asking you where Alex was, did you tell him about no. what had happened? I did not tell him, no. Why not? I was overwhelmed and I was terrified. I didn't, I, I didn't know what to do. Well, given that you're safe in a hospital and not in any present danger, talking to the police about what happened to you, you tell them what happened. Lying about what you just went through only makes you seem untrustworthy and like you have something to hide. When you don't tell him, was there any thought in your head that had you told him some help could be gotten for Alex, or what did you think had happened to Alex at that point? 
At that point, I thought Alex was dead. Was that also something you thought as you cut boy into your arm and ran away from the car? Yes. Why did you tell Detective Proc that Alex put boy in your arm? Why I told him this was that I was afraid that because I did this to wake myself up that he wouldn't believe that anything else that had happened to me was true. But at this point, you're not telling him the other things that have happened to you. No. And you're making a decision not to. Yes. Why is that? Because of how terrified I am of what had happened. So she is scared that she won't be believed, but she's lying to them about what happened, but also she's not telling them fully what happened because she's scared of the memory of it happening. You know what? I've changed my mind. That makes perfect sense. I, I think she's probably innocent, everybody. The next day, and, and again, I realize these seem like one incident to you, but Detective Brock comes back with another investigator, yes. Mr. Conkey, and he's asking you questions and you don't tell him then right away either. No. Do you know why? Because of how terrified I was. I wasn't ready to tell anybody. I didn't know how to process this. I didn't know how to handle this. At some point in that conversation, he told you that they had found your car. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. When he told you that, did you start talking about what happened? Yes, it started to come out then. And eventually, in that conversation, not right away, did you tell him that you had put the word boy in your arm? Yes. And again, were you hesitant to tell him that? Yes. I mean, even after you told him all of these things and what happened, were you yes, hesitant? Yes, I was. And why was that? Because after I told him, I still had that thought in my mind that he would assume that because I had done this, anything else that happened to me was my fault. The lawyer phrases these questions as if Ezra admitted this to the officer of her own volition, as if she stopped in the middle of the interview and admitted that she lied about certain things, but that didn't happen. She only admitted that she lied once the detectives made it clear that what she was saying didn't align with any of the evidence they found at the scene. She stated Alex had carved the word boy into her arm until Detective Proc told her that that was impossible. She doubled down on the fact that she couldn't remember anything because of the trauma until the detectives told her they knew it wasn't true. Moreover, if she was too scared to talk to them, she was well within her rights to end the interview and tell them that. In both interviews, she was repeatedly asked if it was okay to talk to them and she said yes, but now she was so scared and traumatized, she was not ready to talk. Ezra, the night before this happened, did you have a talk with your father? Yes. What was that talk? I'm sorry. <clears throat> that talk with my father was about life starts now. And when you had that talk, did you plan to start life by killing Alex? No. Did you come to Eau Claire to kill him? No. What were you hoping to do when you saw Alex? I was hoping we could be friends still, even after everything that happened between us. I have no further questions at this time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 15-minute recess. The only time she has cried on the stand or displayed any emotion is here, when she cries one single tear, talking about how she talked to her father before she killed Alex. And it's in an entirely self-serving way. Great. Ezra's explanation of events doesn't make any sense, and it's likely that this direct examination already buried her in the minds of the jury. But things were about to get worse for her in the cross-examination. Thank you so much for watching this video. I've been recording for the past couple of days, so I expect this video will be incredibly lengthy. If you have made it to this portion of the video, thank you again. Your support during this time has meant a lot to my brother and I, and without it, who knows where we would be. If there's a case you would like to see us cover, or a video you would like to see made on this channel, email us at dreading.official at gmail.com. If you're interested in getting those videos a month early, feel free to join our Patreon. And as always, remember to stay safe.